He said, someone's going to reach out to you in the next couple of months and I have a business opportunity for you. It's up to you whether or not you, you choose to go with it. But he said, you can make a lot of money. You can earn a lot of money. And then that started a whole nother chapter for me. Today's guest is Germano Tomasetti. He is a Canadian criminal and mafia affiliate. He made millions of dollars around the world laundering money for criminal groups and pulling scams like identity theft. This guy ran scams in four continents in seven years. He had bank accounts all over the world. He was rubbing shoulders with some of the most ruthless Albanian and Italian criminal gangs. He lived in South America. He was laundering money through Panamanian bank accounts. This guy is like a James Bond novel. It was wild. You're gonna love this episode. He told us some stuff that was truly too crazy to show on the YouTube. You can hear that on the bonus episode if you go over to patreon.com slash The Connect Show and make sure to check out his book coming out called The Winnipeg Story. Without further ado, I give you Germano Tomasetti right here on The Connect. Sometimes we actually have that choice in life, like that one choice that changes everything. That same day or the same week, I lost a quarter million dollars, which was all my money at the time. That's when I see the lights behind me start to flash. And I didn't even think, I just hit it. I was driving like my life depended on it. And then I parked the car, hopped out, closed the door, and I started running. And he pulls out a burner, shanks, like six inches. And then he passes it to me. And he goes, here, that's yours. Don't ever leave the cell block without this. He was the reason I made it out of that place alive. Germano <laughs> Tomasetti. Tomasetti, yeah. I'm, I'm not a like betting that. man, yep. but if I had to gamble, I'd say it's Italian. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're the first Canadian we've had on the show, man. That's great. That's You're great. from Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. My family is from Calgary. Oh, really? Yes. That is news to me. So we yeah. knew a lot about Winnipeg growing <clears throat> up. We always associated it with being a rough place, Yep. a working class wrong. place. Yep. Tell us about it. How was it like for you growing up? Yeah, so it was, uh, you know, if you want to compare it to like, you know, uh, something in the U.S., uh, I would say something like Detroit, you know what mm. I mean? Just blue collar, mm -hmm. hardworking people um, and and a city that slept on a lot, you know what I mean? The whole idea of what I wanted to do with the book was was put it out there because there's, there's so many interesting stories. There's very interesting people, but because it's this blue collar place that kind of gets ignored, right? Nobody would think that a Canadian would look like you. Right. You look like you own a pizza shop in the outer boroughs of Brooklyn. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Are, are there a lot of uh, Italians, Italian Canadians in Winnipeg? In Winnipeg? Yeah, yeah definitely. So um, the country is pretty split up. Like uh, if you look at the northern and southern Italians, uh, obviously everybody knows like in Quebec and Montreal with the Sicilian mob and stuff like that. And right. Ontario is more Calabrian. And uh, wow. Winnipeg is, I'd say it's a good mix of both. You know what I mean? Um, Winnipeg itself on, on the other side of things, beside it being a, a blue collar, uh, city, it's also a very important place in the underworld and uh, in, in Canada's underworld because we're dead center, right? We're the mm. Midwest. So everything that comes from Vancouver has to pass through us and everything that comes from the ports in Montreal and in Ontario also have to pass through us. Right. Right. So it was, uh, it was, a. Uh, it was an important piece of the puzzle for a lot of people. You look at a lot of the bikers and the organized crime and stuff like that. Winnipeg's always been a key place. And if if people dig deep enough, you know, even on Google or whatever else, you'll find that uh, that a lot of people wanted it. A lot of people wanted to kind of take it over. But it's almost kind of this freelance place. It's like everyone's kind of out there doing their own thing. There's no real boss. There's no real uh, control of the mm. city. It's just kind of independent groups doing what they want and they all mesh together well and fascinating. Who, yeah. who are those groups? Um, so obviously the Italians are in there. Mm. Uh, they have to be anywhere in North America. Right. Um, but there's also, uh, our, our big foreign group out there is Filipinos, right? Mm. So we have one of the, if not the largest, one of the largest, uh, Filipino, um, communities in Winnipeg in Manitoba. And, uh, after them, Ukrainians. Ukrainians have actually been there for quite a while. Polish. Uh, and then, yeah, you're going to see the bikers coming in constantly yeah. just because of, you know, it's like it's almost like a way station. Are native gangs uh, present in Definitely. the city? Definitely. I think I saw something about how native gangs are pretty wild in, yeah. in Saskatchewan in general. No, I'm sorry, Manitoba. Yeah, yeah, no, but you're not wrong with Saskatchewan, though, either, because they, they we're very similar, right? Mm -hmm. We're both prairie, prairie provinces mm -hmm. uh, and... And we have a lot of the same ideologies and the same criminal 
criminal groups and stuff like that. There's definitely, you know, Aboriginal gangs and Indian gangs. They're, they're very heavy because they have the numbers, right? Right. So if you wanted to look at who's the biggest group in, in Winnipeg, it's, it's definitely them because there's mm. just so many of them. They worked within Canada. They worked with U.S. groups and stuff like that, but they didn't really branch out to South America, Colombia, mm -hmm. Italy, any of these other places, right? So so yeah. what when you were growing up, uh, I don't know how old you are. 30, 35. I okay. just turned 35, yeah. So when you were growing <laughs> up, what was the big racket? What was the money maker that you were either involved in or, uh, you know, you had family members or community members that was involved So what involved age in? are we talking here? Like, well, take us back from the beginning. Do you have okay. uh, wise guys being Italian? Do you have, you know, uh, Sicilian or Italian mafia in your family? Um, so I'm, I come from a background, um, uh, Calabrese, Calabrian. And, and Abruzzese from Abruzzo, which is close to Lazio, close to Rome and stuff like that. Um, there's definitely members in my family that are in organized crime. You'll probably notice this just from the people that you've talked to even before me. We don't like to say certain words. We don't like to say certain organizations. So I'll, I'll refer to someone as Calabrian. Mm. I'll refer to someone as Albanian. I'll refer to someone as Chinese or whatever. I'm not going to say actual groups. And that's just out of the respect of the people that I've worked with throughout the years. They're just, that's the way that they are. They don't like to be mentioned. So if somebody is involved in organized crime, you call them a Calabrian. That's like the code word. No, see that, that for like me, how do you, it's just how do you like, refer to a mobster, say of Italian origin mm -hmm. in the U S it's a wise guy. They well, don't like we, saying we don't mafia. Say, we don't even say you, mobster, bro. Like we don't, in Canada, we don't speak like that. Like, and, and that's just, that's my experience mm. with it. I'm not saying that nobody speaks like that because, you know, everybody is definitely influenced from, uh, you know, mob culture. Like, and we're talking about American mafia, La Cosa Nostra, that kind of thing. But uh, we, we, we just refer to people as who they are, like their ethnic backgrounds. Do you know what I mean? We're not going to say the name of the organization because a lot of these are still secret. Mm. You know, you know, some names, for instance, um, you know, we were talking earlier and I, I was talking about uh, the podcast that you did, the episode that you did that, that uh, introduced me to you. And that was the episode that you talked about Cartagena. So the group that you talk about there uh, that, you know, you were connected with and that you knew, I know is a different name now. Right. Mm, yeah. So that's another thing. Names are changing and factions are changing and stuff like that. Totally. So for me, okay, let's take it back to the beginning. I didn't get involved into serious crime. And, and that means, uh, you know, when I got into money laundering and I got into, um, uh, debt collections for organized crime and stuff like that till I was about 26. So that doesn't mean that I, I wasn't doing illegal activity earlier. You no, know, when I was younger, I was doing stupid. You know what I mean? I was, uh, you know, I was in the streets with some of my friends, African gangs and stuff like that. And we would rob people or whatever like that. I tried to stay out of it, to be honest. I hung around with a lot of guys that were doing dirt, but I was trying not to. Um, I didn't like drug dealing. It wasn't for me. I, is there meth up in Can up in the middle of Canada? Winnipeg is starting to become a, a location for that, which really sucks. You know what I mean? Because that hard shit, bro, like whether it's crack or whether it's um, meth, or, you know, a uh, fentanyl, fentanyl is a, sure. you know, huge problem everywhere right now in mm -hmm. North America, including, including my city. Yeah. And that's why you see so many wars going on. You know what I mean? Like there's an internal struggle right now, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, in, uh, Montreal. And there has been for years because Montreal is like, everybody wants that. The Americans want it. The, the organized crime groups, wh whoever it is, you mm -hmm. know, Italian, Irish, French, um, they all want that port because it's just, if you have that, you have the whole Northeast section, mm -hmm. right? So we're talking about Boston as well. We're talking about New York. We're talking about not just Canada, right? And if you really, again, you dive into the history, you'll see that, um, you know, there was an attempt back in the day from the Bananos uh, to to try and whack out the Montreal boss mm. and that failed. And, and our guys, like the Canadian gangsters, ended up whacking out their, their boss. Is that you, right? Yeah. You yeah. guys beat us? You can look at it. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was crazy. Wow. But uh, yeah, it's just such a rich port. There's there's so much money uh, in Canada now. Um, just the other day, the biggest bust ever in, in Toronto history happened. So it was $90 million worth of uh, product. There's okay. hundreds of kilos being busted. So I'm, I'm wondering like who has the capacity in Toronto or mm -hmm. Toronto, as you say in Canada, uh, <laughs> 
What okay. group? So, it, so without, again, without saying names of the group and you can leave it to your imagination or whatever, but bikers, right? Bikers are huge in Canada, uh, especially on the coasts, which mm-hmm. is where, where, where it's important, right? Uh, to, to be a sig- significant, uh, number of people. They definitely have a lot of people on the coast. Mm-hmm. Um, the Italians, definitely. Uh, there's, there's a certain group. Again, I, I can't say the name because, uh, I'm friends with a lot of these guys and out of respect, I can't, I can't say anything or I don't want to, but, um, a certain group from Southern Italy, their faction in Canada, in Ontario is now becoming one of the most important in the world. You could almost say it's the base of, of this group. Wow. Uh, so that lets you know how powerful it is wow. in Canada. Yeah. And these guys, you know, they're, are these first generation people? Are these people from the other side or is it there? Is it like in, in New York, you know, the family's Italian, but they've been here for four generations. No. So this, this specific group, these, these, some of these guys have been around for a hundred years. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and we're talking about like prohibition uh, days, you know what I mean? Like they, they've been here that long, but you have to understand, I'd say the biggest difference between, and I'm just, talking about Italians with organized crime between Canadians and Americans is Canadians are actually more traditional. They're actually more old school. And if you talk to a lot of guys overseas, like, you know, in Italy uh, and even other parts of England and Germany and all these other places, the Canadian gangsters, the Canadian organized crime groups, Italians, whatever, uh, they get a lot of respect. Mm -hmm. They do because they're just... They're, they're good at business. There's no, there's no flexing. They're good. They're very good in the shadows. Mm -hmm. And and that's what any organized crime group should really try strive to be certain can't because where they're geographically located, they have to show face. They have to show violence. They have to, you know what I mean? We're talking about, you know, South of border. Uh, But when it comes to these other groups that are operating all over the world, the last thing you want to do is be known. You know what I mean? You you want to be in the shadows. You don't want anyone to see you. So and and Canadian gangsters are really good at that. You know well, I mean? there is something about the modesty of Canadians that yeah. I think plays well to that. You 100%. know, Americans are very ego driven. Mm-hmm. Uh, crime is so celebrated in pop culture that I think a lot of gangsters and drug dealers uh, like to be flashy and they 100%. want people to know them. Uh, so how do you fit into this? So you weren't really a criminal growing up, right? Um, why? I did some dirt, but yeah, nothing, nothing big. What, who yeah. were your parents and what kind of family did you grow up in? Okay. So, um, the way that I grew up was my father was a criminal. Um, he wasn't around much after about 10 years old. I didn't, I didn't see him for like, I don't know, 16, 17 years. He was in and out of jail constantly. Uh, one of the things that's in the book is, uh, he started around 17, eight years old, 17 or 18 years old. You guys have Safeway out here in mm-hmm. the U S yeah, so back in the day, he robbed a Safeway, and this was before, um, before you know, money trucks were going out every day, right? These guys would, like, do it once a week or whatever. Mm-hmm. We're talking, like, 45 years ago, right? So he ended up, when he was 18 or 19 years old, he, he hit up a, a Safeway, and he had two other friends with him, and they got away with about 60 grand, which is a lot of money back then, sure. right? Or 45 years ago. Uh, and then... Yeah, he was always doing criminal stuff like that. Very hard worker, though, like very blue collar as well at the same time. Loved to loved to dance, loved to sing, had an amazing voice, performed in fest- like Italian festivals and stuff like that out there. But um, his real downfall, in my opinion, um, was when he, when he got into drugs, right? So he was always, his whole life, from what I'm told, was very anti-drugs until he was uh, in his early 30s and his cousin kind of introduced him to cocaine. And it led into heroin. Mm -hmm. And once he got into heroin, his life was over. So in the last 20, I want to say 20, 30 years, he was, he was addicted to heroin and, uh, he died a couple years ago during COVID and I wasn't told how he died, but I imagine that it was an overdose or it was suicide one or the other. Right. My mom, complete opposite. Uh, my mom was just like a hard worker. She raised us kids. Uh, it was me and two sisters living at home, uh, two older sisters and she was just a hardworking, good woman, kind of the glue of the family, kept everybody together. But I never had a good relationship with her. And that was on, on me. I was very angry, like the, from the moment I was born, I don't know. But uh, there was something inside of me that had this, this anger towards her and my sisters and, 
and beyond authority and you know i always had that the cold that, yeah whatever it is <laughs> yeah but uh I'll fast forward a little bit here because um, there's so much to tell about my childhood, but you know, this is a, a true crime po podcast at the end of the day. So you're 26. Right? What changed? I was working at a call center. I was making decent money at that time, like, like 20 something dollars an hour, which I was happy with. You know what I mean? Um, but I had this weird thing going on with this married woman there. And this woman was like a 10. You know what I mean? Like this is not a woman that I should have something going on with, but I think that, um, she just liked what I represented. She was very miserable in a relationship. I was this fun younger guy that was taking her out to hookah lounges and bringing her around rappers and stuff like that. You know what I mean? So she, she was very intrigued by that. And it was, it started super fun and just, you know, we're kidding and stuff mm. like that. And then it, it just seemed like she took it a little too far and she told me that she was going to leave her husband and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, what, you know, we weren't, or anything like that. You know what I mean? Excuse me. I don't know if I can swear here, but sure. Okay. You know, it was starting to get uncomfortable for me. And then one day I went and talked to the supervisor and I was like, listen, man, like I need you to move me or her. Like, I don't care which one it is. You can move me or whatever. And, and, and he asked me why. And I told him and he starts laughing and I don't blame the guy because she, like I said, she was a 10. Like yeah, if well, you Winnipeg 10. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'll no, 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 no. <laughs> We'll say an LA7 or an LA8. That's whatever. good. Okay. There you go. All right. <laughs> That's decent, right? Mary Ballsmas from our friends over at Manscaped. The holidays are approaching, but what if I told you that the celebration started early this year? It turns out the perfect gift does exist, and who else to bring it down your chimney than the leaders in below-the-belt grooming? do 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 Keep calm and let your balls jingle this season with Manscaped's brand-new performance package, 5.0 Ultra featuring the new lawnmower 5.0. Watch all your wishes and mistletoe kisses come true. Look nice when you're going naughty by going to manscaped.com and use code CONNECT, C O N N E C T, for 20% off plus free shipping. You guys, you know about the lawnmower 5.0. I've told, I've plugged it on this show multiple times. This is the only way to trim your balls. You use any other razor, you will cut Nick. It's incredibly painful. You guys are all shaven with cheap electronic razors you buy at Target. It's it's going to come back and bite you on the balls, literally. Okay? Unwrap the gift of smoothness this season with Manscaped. When you get the Manscaped performance package, uh, it's bundled. It's got all this cool stuff. Not only does it come with the lawnmower, but it comes with the Weed Whacker 2.0, the ear and nose trimmer, a bunch of liquid formulations. Uh, all of these cool free gifts inside a, a brush, you know, it's, they give you the whole thing when you go over and get that package. The gift of Manscaped doesn't stop there. This bundle comes with two free gifts, Manscaped's Boxers 2.0 premium underwear and the Shed 2.0 toiletry bag. You guys, it's the holiday season. It's Christmas. It's Hanukkah. This is an easy brainless gift. That's amazing. It works for any male relative. Get it for your dad, your brother-in-law, your brother. This is, I'm going to supply all of my male relatives with this and it's appreciated. Everybody needs this. Go over right now, get 20% off and free shipping with the code connect at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code C O N N E C T manscaped. Get your jingle balls ready for the holidays. So I tell this guy, he laughs in my face. He thinks I'm joking or whatever. And I, I said, man, like I, you know, if you don't do this, then I got to quit. And he's like, you know, then go. And that was it. So after this, I decided like to take a break just from life. Right. So I decided to be homeless. Okay. And I'm not talking about on the streets. I'm not talking about like, you know, doing drugs and squeegee guy or whatever like that. But I, I decided to go to a shelter and take a couple months to myself where I just like, recuperated from everything that I've been going through for several years, right? Which is uh, discussed in the book. If you want to know more about the earlier years, read the book. There's the, you know, the first half of the book really is about um, my life and how I grew up and a lot of more uh, in depth and emotional stuff. But the other half of the book is the, the, you know, the criminal aspect. So I spent a couple of months um, homeless and uh, to be honest, it was great for me. Mm. <laughs> it's almost like, uh, you know, my father was institutionalized from jail. Right. So, you know, having a bed, having the three meals, having, you know, your workout regiment or whatever the f it was like certain guys operated well like that. I never thought I would, 
because I was always kind of like a wild card and I didn't like structures or systems or anything like that, but I somehow fell in love with it almost there. And, um, it was a peaceful time in my life. It was the calm before the storm. Right. Um, shortly after I meet a guy who's, uh, an Italian guy from another part of Canada, I believe from Quebec, right? I believe he was Sicilian. Um, and he, I also believe that he was hiding out, right? He was hiding out in my city. There had been a bust recently, a huge Canadian bust uh, in Ontario and Quebec. Uh, and a bunch of guys were on the run. A bunch of guys got caught, like a couple hundred of them got caught. Uh, it was huge. And this guy, his story wasn't adding up when I saw him. You know what I mean? Like he didn't stay at the place because I actually slept there, right? But uh, he would come by a lot. You could tell the guy was a little bit lonely. He wasn't completely all there. And he was, uh, he was older. Right. So I, the way that I met him was like, you know, he, I think I was wearing like, you know, like a soccer Jersey one day, uh, Italian Jersey. And he asked me if I was Italian. I said, yes. He starts talking to me in his language was Sicilian. My Italian's not very good. My Spanish is good now because mm. I spent so much time in Latin sure. America later on, but, um, my Italian wasn't good. And the dialects in the South are completely different, right? Sicilian has Greek in it. It has some Arabic. Mm. I don't know what the this guy's saying to me. So I, I said, I said, listen, man, like, you know, I'm Italian, but I don't speak that much. And I definitely don't speak Sicilian, but we, we, we hit it off and I just kind of helped this guy out to be honest. Um, I would, you know, grow, grab food for him. You know what I mean? Um, I would, if he was cold, I go grab him a blanket. You know, he's like a grandpa. Do you know what I mean? Mm. And he had some interesting stories. I think he was nuts, but he had some very interesting stories just about, uh, how he grew up in Sicily and stuff like that. One day I notice him eating and uh, he has dentures, right? And his teeth fall out, right? His top, top row of teeth fall out. And um, that's not that weird, you know, whatever. Old guys have dentures. But then I noticed he was eating as well, right? He's, he was eating at the same time. And I noticed his fingertips, right? Um, they were like gone. So what I mean by that is like, if you can picture someone dipping your fingers in acid, Right. And, and, and this, and it almost going down to the bone, right. That's what his fingers looked like. So you couldn't really see, you know, you look at your finger right now and you, you see the patterns, right. Of your fingerprints. And he didn't have that. Right. So I thought that was really strange. And I rem keep in mind, uh, this guy was always telling me stories that didn't add up. But when I saw this, I saw dentures and I saw the fingerprints thing. The first thing that I thought was, remember, I also thought this guy was on the lamb, mm, right. Mm. And, you know, there's a lot of guys that will go to extreme measures when they're on the lamb, right? Plastic surgery, uh, getting rid of their fingerprints and their teeth to, to be identified, right? I don't know if it works so much in Canada, but if you're from, you know, a farm from back home or whatever, that will work great. You know, if you don't have your, if they don't have your, 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 uh, dental, your dental records, records wow. or your fingerprints, mm -hmm. right? So that confirmed to me that this guy you know, he's a little shady. Like, you know, I already kind of knew that, but to be honest, like I'd seen so much in my life and I was so comfortable in the, in the dark, we'll say in the, in the underworld and the shadows, whatever it was that it didn't bother me at all. I was just kind of like more intrigued. I was like, okay, now who the f is this guy, you know? And then shortly, shortly after, like I said, this is going on for a couple of months. Shortly after, uh, I'm, I'm walking back to the, the mission, right. Where, where I was staying. And, uh, I see him and he comes up to me, he says, I'm leaving, I'm going home. And I said, I said, well, where the f is that? You know, he's like, uh, you know, out East, he said out East. And I already knew, I'm pretty sure he's from Quebec, you know, to this day. He never told me, but, um, he said, you know, I want to thank you for everything. You've been a great friend to me. You've been my only friend here. You're the only person that's kind of looked out for me. I didn't know anyone here. And, uh, he, he never really again explained to me what he was doing there but he was just really appreciative that someone on, on a real level too, like, you know, not on, on, on some G code or something like that, but it was just, you know, a young guy looked after him. You know what I mean? It made him feel like, you know, more comfortable there. And, uh, he basically said to me, like, you know, I'm going to have some work for you in the future. I think that you're going to, you know, that you're, that you're a capable guy and, and I trust you and you seem loyal and you did all these things for me when you didn't have to, you don't know who I am or, you know, and, and I, I, he even told me, he's like, I know you're a smart guy. I know you knew that I was lying to you half the time, but it's because I had to, 
I can't trust anybody. And, and that kind of let me know, okay, yeah. So he told me that someone was going to reach out to me. I, I handed him, uh, I didn't hand him, but I wrote down uh, my email, my phone number. And he said, someone's going to reach out to you in the next couple of months. And I have a business opportunity for you. It's up to you whether or not you, you choose to go with it. But he said, you can make a lot of money. You can earn a lot of money. Bro, I'm homeless. Like, I don't have a job at this point. So somebody tells me I can make a lot of money. Obviously, I'm going to go for it. So uh, shortly after I got out of the, <clears throat> the mission and I moved into an apartment with a, with a friend at the time. And uh, I was at a, a bar, a friend's bar, hookah lounge, and I got a phone call <clears throat> from a French Italian guy. <clears throat> so it just confirmed to me even more, excuse me, uh, that this guy was from Quebec. And uh, he basically said he's a friend of the old man. And uh, he knows it's my birthday or that my birthday was coming up mm. or whatever. And he, you know, he had a gift for me. I was like, a gift? He's like, I'm going to be at uh, Winnipeg Airport in a couple hours, right? A three-hour flight or two-and-a-half-hour flight, whatever it was. But I want you to meet me here. I didn't meet him at the airport. I met him somewhere else. He obviously knew my city, though. You know, uh, from this, like I said, he was an outsider. He sounded like he was from Quebec. But he, he knew, oh, you know, go over to this place by this place. And I'm like, how the f does this guy know where, the, where, where these things are? So I go and meet the guy, and uh, he just basically says to me, what the old man said, but he repeats it through himself. And he said, you know, when the old man was here, like you, you're the only person that, uh, he considered a friend. Uh, he had a lot of enemies. He couldn't let people know who he was or where he was or anything like that. And you didn't seem to care. You know, he'll never forget, you know, the times that you brought him his food or that, you know, his teeth would fall out and you wouldn't laugh at him. You'd help him. I'd pick up his teeth and I'd go clean him, give it back to him. You know what I mean? He really respected that. Um, and for me, it was just, I'm an empath. I'm natural. I want, I want to help people. You know what I mean? I've always felt like a leader, but in a, in a way that not like a dominant violent leader, but like just taking care of the people around me. Right. So he goes on to tell me, he's like, you know, he said that uh, you might be interested in making some money. So, you know, I have two envelopes for you. So he hands me one envelope. He's like, that's your gift. You know, happy birthday. Thanks for everything you did for the old man. He appreciates it. I appreciate it. We appreciate it. I remember he kept saying we a lot. Mm. We appreciate it. So let me know that there's a group involved. Um, and then he hands me another envelope and he's like, you know, take a look inside after I leave and, and make your decision. There's a number at the bottom of this piece of paper. And if you're interested you, you can call me. So I open this first, the gift, right. You know, after I walk away and get How into much a taxi, was it? it was about, it was about, um, I can't remember exactly. And I'm always bouncing back. It was, I want to say it was like $3,800, mm, right? Okay. And keep in mind, I'm broke at the time. Yeah. So 3,800 bucks is like, that's paying my rent for a month or two. And like, you know, putting some food in the, in the fridge, I'm really happy. And then in the other uh, envelope was a list of names, uh, phone numbers, uh, addresses, and amounts in dollars, right? So I, I kind of gathered, you know, I had to call the guy after a couple of days after I thought about it, but th these were debts. You know what I mean? Mm. Yeah. So what kind, of, and, what kind of debts were they? What amounts? Do you remember? Yeah. So I remember the first couple of, it's almost like he did it in order, which I really like because I like people that are like anal like that, you mm -hmm. know, put it in order alphabetically and all that kind of stuff. I don't know why I'm like that, but I like organized. So, you know, you start at the top and there was like, you know, $850, like there's nothing, mm -hmm. three grand, whatever. I think the final amount, because there was about 10 different names and numbers on there. And, um, I think the last amount was around 15 K or whatever. Right. And all it said was like, you know, if, if, if you're interested, like contact me back. Right. So eventually I call the guy from a, from a payphone, <clears throat> and I say, you know, is this what I think it is? Like, you want me to go collect this money? And he's like, yeah. He's like, can you handle that? I was like, yeah, no problem. And where were these people <clears throat> located in my city? Okay. Uh, okay. So there was two there was one in ontario and there, and there was one in quebec as well in montreal or no sorry laval in quebec right which is outside of uh montreal but uh and that was the bigger amount actually i should say that um so all of them went well to be honest like i i collected in winnipeg first because i had never gone to these other provinces and i didn't really know a lot of people there i had some family but not like connected guys or anything mm -hmm. just family members that would tell me like what to do in the city or whatever um so everything went smoothly and, and how, how did, did you have any resistance? Like how do you how did you how did you go about collecting money? Okay, so 
this again, this is explained in the book, but I really want to, I want to make it clear. Like I wasn't a tough guy. You know what I mean? Like I could be right. Like a lot of people know me as a tough guy in the sense that, um, I can be hard to deal with. I got a bit of an anger problem sometimes. Like if you piss me off, mm -hmm. I'll explode that kind of, shit. but I was not like a violent guy. So I was the guy that they sent before they sent the other guy. Right. So like when it's not that serious, I go in there and I was like, you know, I'll, if you owe three, five grand, whatever it is, say, listen, man, just put something on it. You know what I mean? If you can't pay the full amount, just pay something. If you owe three to five grand, you know, pay 500 bucks, pay a thousand, give me something so that I can go to this guy and say, he's trying, mm. you know, so you don't get your ass kicked. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And then there was obviously someone, someone, someone bigger. And, uh, did you know why they owed money? Yeah. So it ranged, bro. So it ranged from everything from gambling. Sure. Um, like horse races and stuff yeah. like that, which is something in Winnipeg. You know, I never thought that that exists in Winnipeg, but I found out earlier on that, that it was. Yeah. We've learned actually, uh, <clears throat> just through the course of the show. I mean, honestly, wherever there's blue collar money, mm -hmm. you have a lot of gambling going gambling. on, a lot yeah. of horse racing, fixed. a lot of fixed stuff. Yeah. That, Oh wow. Yes. Of yeah. course. I saw, I saw your guest the other day and I actually, I know a guy that was doing that. And of course, wherever you have Italians, you have, you know, organized crime, you have yeah, rackets, rackets like this and yeah. gambling and sports gambling specifically, I mean, is, yep. is one of the most prevalent, uh, you it's know, huge. rackets amongst yeah. Italian That's why I don't crime. watch sports, man. Mm. Yeah. I love soccer, football, whatever you want to call it. Uh, but I can't even enjoy it. Cause I just always think like this is probably fixed, man. You know, like, Cause, and, and some of it goes on such a high level. Like, you know what I mean? You, you've heard a lot of stories. I'm sure even NBA and NFL. And I, I doubt like that's that. happening anymore. If it happens, it's probably with, you know, ultra rich Middle Eastern, Saudi Qataris, right, you know, that buy money, their eh? whole teams. Yeah. I don't think the, you know, and they are doing that though. Yeah. You, know, you look probably. at like premier league in the yeah. England, they're buying entire football clubs right now. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. So you're collecting this money. Yeah. Uh, you got, you, how much did you, were you able to get 80% of it? 70% of it? Did you get all of it? All of it. Wow. Yeah, the, the first run, the first run, I got all of it. And he wasn't expecting that. He's just saying work it, but I'd say within two and a half weeks, I got everything and it totaled up to, I'd say probably around 30 grand. Mm-hmm. Right. Which he was very happy with. And keep in mind, like this guy was sending me to do this, not just on his behalf, but on other people's behalf, because you know how it is like with bookies and stuff like that, like, um, they'll hire someone externally. Right. So for instance, let's say if, if I went to these guys and it was a larger amount, let's say like, cause it did get much larger la later down the road, which I'll talk about, but, um, let's say it was like 50 grand. Right. And, and I went in, went in there and I was like, listen, man, you got to kick up five or 10 right now. And the guy's like, F you go f yourself, you know, then we would send in someone else. And it was typically biker type guys. If it wasn't bikers at all, because the truth is from my experience and, and, and this is just my experience, Italians will kill you. You know what I mean? Like they, they really will. And, and bikers, they're, they're tough as they're big guys. They're intimidating. They know how to smash people's heads in, but they can also like control themselves a little bit, which, which might sound nuts to you. But, uh, there's, I know a lot of Italian guys that, that when they fly off the handle, they can't stop. It, it, it can't just be a beating. Mm. Do you know what I mean? So they, they, they purposely like, you don't, if this guy's making you, even if he, even if he's been a, and he doesn't want to pay, you know, you look at the long run how much you're making off this guy for years, mm -hmm. right? Even if he's being a little, you still want to have him in your, yeah, he's a long-term customer. He's a long-term customer. Yeah, murder, yeah. murder is not so easily done, especially when you just have like an addicted gambler. Like exactly. at the end of the day, you look at what he's paid. It's like, well, he's paid me a half a million bucks. So mm -hmm. what if he's late this time? Mm -hmm. But it sounds like uh, the Italians are, you know, they've risen to like a white collar level. Now they're running, gambling mm. rackets and they use the bikers for the dirty work. They're the brutes. Yeah. Okay. And, and it's been like that for a while. If you look the most uh, interesting politics, mm -hmm. like gangster politics that exists in Canada, that's ever existed in Canada is in Quebec. Yeah. So if you, if you ever watch bad blood, like about the Rizzutos and stuff like that, yeah. Um, that's all facts, man. So like 
it, you know, you had Irish, Haitians, French, and Italians and bikers all working together. And it was under this, this system. And unfortunately that system f has failed, right? Uh -huh. Like Vito Rizzuto died. Uh, and he was really our godfather in Canada. It doesn't matter if you were Calabrian or Sicilian or a biker or whoever, that guy is Canada's biggest gangster ever. I don't care what anybody says. Uh -huh. That's just a fact. The guy had stupid money, stupid power. And um, he's like our John Gotti, something like exactly. that. Exactly. He was, and he kind of was like that, mm. you know, he, he you know, I, I don't want to say anything else. Other than when, that, uh, what, are the, what are the laws around organized crime? Like, so I know the RC, RCMP, Royal RCMP, Canadian yep. amount of police, that's your FBI. Basically. Yeah. What, yep. what, Our like, uh, what are the, do they have big Rico laws, like big, uh, organized crime racketeering laws in Canada, the way they do in the U S to take down the mafia? No, really? Yeah. Oh, that's uh, why it's probably so prevalent still. Yeah. Um, that, that that's not to say that they don't exist at all, yeah. right? Like that there there's definitely it's not Rico, it's not called Rico or anything like that. I don't know what it's called, and I'm I'm just gonna be honest here. But you don't see that typically. You don't see that in Canada. Like the person that is caught doing what they're doing wrong mm -hmm. is the person that's charged, right? They don't even like to say like uh with the um the news report I told you the other day, the biggest bust that we had in Ontario, there was ninety million dollars worth of product. They don't, they don't say any names. They don't say any organized, you know, crime groups or anything like that, even though it was obvious, like, you know, it was to me, it was obvious. Well, it's because they're so PC in Canada too. They don't want to say, oh, there's a bunch of Italians. There's a bunch of, yeah. Uh, so, okay. Wow. That, that stands to reason then that there's yeah. still a lot of entrenched, like old school Definitely. organized crime. Definitely. So take us fast forward us now. So you, do you do a good, you do a good job? Yeah. Uh, what comes next? Okay, so the the debt collections I did for about a year and a half. And how right? much are you keeping? How much do you get to make? 10%, okay. typically. Yeah, which which I was happy with, bro. Be, because the first month, I'd say the first month that I did it, uh, I probably made 8K, right? 8,500. Eight, 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 yeah. And f man, like I, you know, I was, I just come from being homeless and broke and poor. So $8,500 is a lot of money. Yeah. And I knew that it was only going to get bigger. Mm -hmm. The amounts were going to get bigger. The trust in me was going to get bigger. So you know what I mean? Um, I ended up, you know, over that year and a half, I'd say I probably did at the end of it, like around 150 to 160 K. Right. Wow. In yeah. Collections. Yeah, exactly. So obviously I didn't save all of it. You never save all of right. it. I didn't save. Mm. I'm notorious for that. Mm. Um, but I saved tens of thousands of dollars. And I eventually walked away. I, I walked away from it for two reasons. So um, I was told that it was a good idea for me to start um, carrying a pistol, right? Carrying heat, which I never did. I never did for a year and a half. And I wasn't comfortable with it. I didn't like it because I didn't want to have to use it. Mm -hmm. Point blank period. I'm not going to, I was making good money, but I'm not going to kill someone over like 10 grand, 20 grand. That's just stupid. You know, I'm not going to go to jail for 10, 20, 30 lifetime, whatever the fuck it was, even though it's less in Canada, mm -hmm. right? More lenient. Um, so how that common was, is it, how common is, is it for Canadian criminals to have guns? Because there really are no second amendment rights there. I know a lot, every Canadian has a rifle because they love hunting, mm -hmm. but handguns, illegal handguns. It's terrible in the streets, bro. Really? So everybody's packing. Yeah. So like a lot of the guys, you know, we we're talking about the Aboriginal groups, right? Yeah. The African gangs. Uh, a lot of Arabs coming yeah. over, like the Syrians that came in, mm -hmm. the refugees, Afghanis, Iraqis, and stuff like that. They're pretty big out there. They are some wild and they're heavy loaded. Wow. Yeah. They And they don't give a to use it, to be honest. Wow. And that's, again, it's kind of what I don't like about Winnipeg because whenever you, and you know this, bro, whenever you go to a place that is controlled by a certain organization or group, petty crime and a little shit like that almost, it, it doesn't exist. Right. Because right. they run their city, their country, their province, their state, whatever you want to call it, like a business. Mm -hmm. So when someone gets robbed, a tourist gets robbed or whatever, that's bad for business. Now you got cops. Now you got heat. Now you got mm -hmm. media attention. Mm -hmm. The problem with my city is that there's no one in full control. There's definitely strong players. And a lot of these guys communicate with each other and stuff like that. But the kids, you know, and I call them kids, even though I'm, I'm 35, I'm still young for, for, you know, for a lot of those guys, the old timers, but I'm talking like 20 year olds, like 25 year olds and even younger. Uh, they're just wild, man. So it's become like a street gang situation. Yep. Like 
any American city, Chicago. Yes. Okay. And it's changing. Yeah. And I also told you how, you know, it's starting to look like we're having uh, external forces coming mm -hmm. into. So it's not a good mm -hmm. combination going on right now. Right. I'm sure the, the bikers, the Hells Angels, yep. are, they're notorious for running guns. Yep. I'm sure that's big business And up they're there. huge in Canada, bro. Mm. You got to wow. keep in mind like Vancouver. Yeah. Probably one of the most important places for that group uh, in the world. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just, it's just, uh, they're, and they're heavy out there. Yeah. So, uh, so now, but now here you are, you're not a gangster. You're mm -hmm. just a guy that's, you know, so you saw an opportunity. Yeah, totally. So yeah. what, <clears throat> so did you get a pistol? How did it no. result? So I told you there, there's two things that were going on that made me decide to, to back away. So one was the pistol. And then I also had a friend that was involved, um, in organized crime in Winnipeg. And he kind of let me know that these guys are, you know, they're impressed with you. They like what you're doing and stuff like that. And it almost sounded like that it was going another route. They were going to start asking me to do other things. Maybe you were going to become the guy that put his hands on people or killed people or. It, it, it felt like it was going away from the debt collections. Yeah. I was fine with the debt collections, but it sounded like it was drugs mm. and it sounded, which I didn't like. And uh, it also sounded like it was, um, you know, putting in work, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. On people, right? So uh, I got over there while I still had the chance. And uh, I almost immediately left the country for the first time ever in my life. Um, I was, it was probably 20, 2015 or 2016 was the first time I actually left Canada. And then- And you didn't tell them obviously, a, right? No, no, I did. No, I did. I did. I, I told them, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, I've been doing this for like a year and a half. And, you know, I'm a young guy. I want to start traveling a little bit. I want to start seeing places. I, I, you know, I was super respectful about it. And because they hadn't made the offer yet, I couldn't refuse. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Right. So it was like they, you know, it, it might have been a different case if they asked me. Right. But I just heard they were about to. So I got the f out of there and, and I started traveling. And that's how I got into other, other uh, crime. Okay. Yeah. So before we, you tell us where you traveled to, mm -hmm. who was that old man with what his, do you mean? with who, who, what position was he? The old man that you took care of with his fingernails or his fingerprints all. He was a capo. Okay. Yeah. Of, of, uh, the Montreal. One of, one of the Montreal. One of them. There's a lot. Italian crime yeah. family. There's, there's okay. a couple that are talked about constantly. Yeah. But there's actually a lot, man. And he, he was on the run from, because yeah. there was a war going on? Or it was from no, the law? No, feds. Okay, feds. gotcha. Yeah, but there was also a war too. Okay. So there, there's constantly a war between the Calabrians in Ontario mm. and the Sicilians in, in Quebec because um, the, the, the Calabrians want the port. Right. Everybody wants the yeah. port. Yeah. Wow. And so they're going to war over the port Constantly. like they do in it's the still old happening country right now. Yep. Wow. Yep. Um, and the guy had his finger or his fingerprints sawed off or yeah, I don't know what it was. Ass, it looked dude. like acid. Yeah. Like that's the yeah. only guess I have for it. But yeah, it was almost wow. like just bone. That's yeah. wild. So where did you go when you left Canada? Okay. So I, ha I have to re retract just a little bit. When I was still homeless, I was sitting there uh, at a hookah lounge. I was talking to my brother and uh, he was telling me he was about to go to Mexico. Um, he just, you know, he loved it out there and, and he thought he found a woman or whatever. So, you know, he's going to go try his thing out there. And now intuition has always been a big thing for me. Dreaming has always been a big thing. I've always visualized things that would happen in my life that actually did. And it, it could be two years later, five years, 10 years later, whatever. If you believe in law of attraction, which I do, mm. uh, I created a lot of images inside my head of what my life was going to look like. And it was absurd to people when I spoke about it. So for my, my brother, for instance, I'm sitting there, I'm homeless at the time. I've got one of those big camper backpacks on my back and I'm telling him like, you know, uh, I don't know how, but at, by the end of this year, I'm going to make a hundred thousand dollars. Right. And he's like, what are you talking about? I had no scams going on. I had no money. I had no job, nothing like that. By the end of the year, I didn't, I didn't make that kind of uh, money, but I, I th think I made around 30 K or whatever. The following year I did 200. Right. So I go to meet my brother. The first place I traveled to to answer the question bluntly is, uh, Mexico. To see my brother. Where right? in Mexico? Cancun. Uh, but real Cancun, not the hotel zone, but like, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the real spot. And, uh, I, you know, I took him out and showed him around and stuff. Unfortunately that trip, I will also say, uh, me and him got in a little bit of a fight. He's not like me. He's not, he's not, he's not, um, he didn't grow up tough. 
You know what I mean? He grew up uh, spoiled, you know, and, and that comes through our relationship. It did. It used to, not now, but it used to come through. He had an attitude. You know what I mean? There was a lot of times that I had to fight people for him because he had a big mouth. He's a year or two younger than me. Um, but, uh, you know, he's, we were in Playa del Carmen mm -hmm. and uh, we were walking around and, and he said something really, you know, just stupid. He, uh, I forget what it was. It was it was not that big of a deal at the time, but it was it was disrespectful. So I slapped him in the back of the head, you know, like I didn't punch him or anything, but I give him a slap. I was like, man, you got to shut the f up like you're in Mexico now. You can't be talking to people like that, whether it's me or anybody else. Like you got to understand, like this is a dangerous place that you're in and I don't want you mouthing off to the wrong guy and getting your head cut off and you being stuffed in a trunk you know what i mean because i was very aw well aware of the culture that you know surrounds these tourist mm -hmm. destinations in in mexico so and unfortunately on that trip two things happened so i get in a fight with my brother don't talk to him for five years after that because he was so cheesed about it um but i got robbed for the only the only time in my life i've ever been robbed was in mexico and it was on that first trip and it was beautiful. I got to say, I, I, you know, <laughs> that sounds ridiculous, but I really like, I really respected how they did it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Even afterwards, I was obviously pissed and a little bit freaked out. Robbed by a hooker. We've all no, been no, there. No, dude. No. <laughs> no, that, that comes later on. Yeah. That's, that's a different part of the world. But, um, so basically what happened is we're taking a bus from the hotel zone to real Cancun where he lives and we get off at this bus stop. And somebody gets off the bus that's wearing one of those tourist uh, guide shirts. The guys that all run around Can Cancun, you know, like uh, all the clubs and stuff like that. So I, I notice it, but I don't think anything of it at the same time. Right. So this kid gets off. He's probably a couple of years younger than me. Maybe he's like 23, 24. He gets off at the same stop as us. Now we have three blocks to walk to get home to his place, my brother's place. But this kid goes right, right away. He goes like, we're, we're walking down a straight street, you know, and he takes one of the side streets. So I think nothing of it. So we're, I'm, we're two blocks away, you know, and then I had a chain on at the time and I just feel the pull. Right. And, you know, it rips and it was, it wasn't a, it was like a thousand dollar chain gold plated. It wasn't anything, uh, excuse me, uh, serious. But when I turned around, the kid that had gotten off the bus with me is, is the one that grabbed the chain and maybe five, 10 feet away from him. There's a, there's another kid about the same age, 24 years old, 23 years old or whatever it is on a scooter pointing a pistol at me. Right. So anyways, I got my revenge though, which is, which is, which is a good part of the story. I ended up paying some, some guy to, to you know, rough the guy up and, and just kind of let him know. And that wasn't so much for me. That was for my brother because I didn't want him looking weak in that neighborhood. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's so strange why you would act that way in Mexico. Like you're, me, you're like acting me? like you're on the streets in, mm -hmm. in Winnipeg. It's like, you don't but live there. It's my there. brother, bro. Yeah. But yeah. You, and I, and I can't, I can't <laughs> like, listen, man, like when, so, you know, the guy's there, he's holding the pistol to me. He's shouting in Spanish. Mm -hmm. My Spanish is non-existent at that time. I don't know what he's saying. So I put my hands up. I let him take the chain. The pendant fell off of the chain. I grabbed that after they had left, but this kid up so what he did was a couple days later he sold uh my chain for some weed and the the guy that he sold it to was a barber in the same barber shop that my brother goes to get his haircut and stuff like that so there's this guy and he i, I think he was like uh part of the well-known el salvadorian gang you know what i'm talking about um Tattoos all over Just the place. Just say the name, dude. Like MS-13. Nobody's coming for you. Hey, but it could what are you be talking one? about? Could be another no, one. No, that's the only <laughs> one. Who gives yeah. a goddamn? Okay. <laughs> so that's what he looked like You don't like come to down me. to be on the connect to be coy. Right. So what were you doing down there? You got your chain back. You got revenge. That's all mm -hmm. petty. Yeah. What, what are you doing in Mexico? What do, you, what do you start doing to make money? You brought five grand down there. Yeah, yeah. What's um, the next step? Well, I, I left shortly after, bro. Okay. Yeah, because of the thing that happened with my brother, right? Right. right. So I spent the rest of the year uh, traveling. I went to um, whatever. I went to New York for the first time, went to Puerto Rico, went to Chile, and I was just chilling. Living. I wasn't, yeah, yeah, living. Yeah, I wasn't doing anything. Um, when I got into my next racket, uh, if you want to call it that, was probably the following year. So I started going to Italy. The first time I went was, uh, I want I think it was... January of 2016 or January of 2017? I'm not completely sure. 
I think it's 2017. Anyways, I go to Italy for the first time. I spent about a month out there. And while I'm there, uh, I was referred to somebody in Milan, right? And and this was just like, you know, this is a good guy. Go check him out. And the other guy was told the same thing about me, right? And uh, it's kind of like, you know, when you meet someone else that's shady because you met him through a certain guy, mm. right? Uh, so for me, like I already knew that the guy that I was meeting was into some uh, and he was this collaborating guy and there's a lot of them in Milan. Milan is a, is a focal point right now. Interesting. For, for Tell us yeah. about that really quick. How is Milan related to the larger, uh, criminal networks in Italy? Oh, Milan is, is like, uh, it's like, how can you say? Cause Milan is Northern Italy. It's very European. It's completely different from the South. But the money, bro. Yeah. There's so much there's money. So there. much money. So yeah. What, what, what are Calabrians and, you know, the people from Naples, the Camorra, what are they doing up in, in Milan? So everything that you can imagine from extortion to, uh, legitimate businesses, right? you got to keep in mind, like the, the, all the Italian criminal organizations for the last, I'd say 20 something years have been trying to legitimize themselves. That doesn't mean that they're not involved in other stuff, but right. They're constantly trying to take that dirty money and put it into clean yeah. money. That's mm -hmm. the name of the game. Yeah. You know what I mean? When yeah. you talk about money laundering and stuff, mm -hmm. you want to have legitimate uh, assets and stuff like yeah. that that can't be taken away from. Right. You, right. So for me, I met this guy. We became, we, we became, you know, pretty close. Uh, I saw him, I'd say maybe three or four times, but we'd spend like six hours together. Um, and he starts talking to me about Panama. Right. And I don't know. If thing about Panama up until then I had only visited Chile, Puerto Rico, Mexico, not on a criminal vibe at all. Mm -hmm. Just going there for a vacation. Now I start hearing about money laundering. I hear about like, uh, the stuff that they're setting up with real estate companies and how they have people inside of the banks. And, and, you know, if I want to get a deposit box, you know, they could, they could do something for me and stuff like that. And then I eventually that same year, not the same trip, because I go to Italy about five times that year. I went back to Europe uh, five times. On top of going to Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, I was all over that year. And that was a year where I made a lot of money too. I had a couple of other scams going on. Um, what were you doing? One of them I can't talk about. I just, I can't. <laughs> uh, it's too close to home. I'll just say it like that. You know, like if the feds are going to get me, I want, it, I want it to be a little bit difficult at least. Okay. So I'm not going to talk about certain things. But one of the things that I was doing was... Um, uh, selling banking information, right? So we would get, uh, we had a guy that had, uh, that would get, you know, it's almost like, uh, you know what the dark web is, you know, how you can get credit cards and, and, uh, profile information. Yeah. We had someone in a bank that would actually get us everything. And it was, it was a for sure thing. So I could get a list of uh, maybe a thousand names with all the personal banking information. And I would pay roughly like. I don't know, maybe three to five grand for this. You know Holy what I mean? For a thousand people's names. Yeah. Where, wh wh where is this located? You could do this that is in Canada. So this is what, this is one of my rackets that I had in Canada. Uh, and the guy, the guy was so rich. Like the guy that, that gave me that connect, right? Because it was somebody else that, that brought me in. He's like, you're a good guy. If you want to make a couple extra grand, do this. He introduced me to some Albanians and some Nigerians in England, in London. And these guys are the masters at, uh, for, for, as far as I know, uh, for um, running credit cards and right, stuff like that. Of course, that. they're notorious for that. Yeah. So explain how it works. You buy uh, this list with all this banking USB info. USB stick. Uh, okay, right. It's all, on a, it's all on a hard drive. Yeah. You buy it from like a teller or the bank manager? Yeah, uh, a teller. Okay. Yeah. So you buy it from a teller. Who do you sell it to and how much do you sell it for? So- Again, I was walked into this. Mm -hmm. So that means that there was already sellers. This guy, the guy that brought me in, Chinese guy, um, he, this was too little for him. This guy, this guy was huge. He was making like, I'm guessing, I don't know, three, $4 million a year. So what I was making off of, so remember I'm paying three to five grand for these USB sticks, right? But I'm going over to London or other parts of England, Cardiff, Wales, spent a lot of time out there as well. And I'm selling this stick for like 10 to 12,000 pounds. Right. Yeah. Which is giving me about 18,000 Canadian. 
So you, and you're selling it to like uh, the Nigerians and or whoever's it, grabbing. It was usually like I I would only do it once or twice a year uh-huh. to be honest. It was just like a little extra money while I'm in England. I can pop this off. You know what I mean? Um, and for me, it was uh, it was always. Albanians and Nigerians. Yeah. That was it. I don't think I ever sold to a, like an Englishman or an Irishman or anything like that. It was always those guys because they were so good. They're so good at what they do. You know, they had the, the, the machines that to make the credit cards and all that wow. kind of stuff. Yeah. They showed me their operation one time. And it was nuts, bro. I walked into this place. that was, it was no bigger than this, what we're in right now, but there's like 20 dudes making cards. You know what I mean? They had like 10 different machines and, God only knows how much those guys were making off of what they spent 15 grand on me for. It's right? way better than drugs. Oh, way better. Way better than drugs. Well, and here's, okay. Gotta get your money out of Canadian banks, folks. <laughs> right? Wow. Um, that's why I stayed away from drugs, bro. So I had a personal issue with drugs, right? Um, a lot of my family was affected by it. A lot of my friends were affected by it. I saw the ugliness in it. Didn't like it. Wasn't for me. But on the other side of things... I also saw the risk and the reward. And I said, I got these guys that I know that are doing blue collar or sorry, white collar crimes and they're making millions. You know what I mean? And it, I know a couple of guys that even got caught. These guys got like three to six months. Right. Some of them didn't even do time. Right. What's the other big scam? So identity theft is gigantic. Mm-hmm. What is that the scam of scams or is there like For another me? kind of fraud? Yeah. And in general, no money laundering. So okay. that, that's when I get into Panama. Gotcha. So keep in mind, I have a couple of these things going on. I'm still collecting debt every once in a while. Like if there's somebody like, you know, oh, I got a guy in Winnipeg because mm-hmm. I'm always in Winnipeg. I, I If I couldn't do it myself, I get someone else to go do it. Right. Uh, so and I'm how still, would you get work? Would you go into a town and say, hey, I need money. And would you call up, me. you know, call up an organization in Montreal and be like, say like, hey, I'm going to be in Winnipeg. If you, if you have anything, no, for no, me. no, no, no. Like how would you garner this work? Like, that, for, you know, well, the debt collections the was cause I, cause I had my guys that I worked with for a year and a half or two years yeah. and they said, you know, if you can do this or whatever, but I wasn't doing that much. So I, again, I got into the, <clears throat> got into the cards and then keep in mind about a year or so back when I'm in Italy, I get introduced to this idea of Panama, but I also get introduced to a man from Panama. Right. And this guy is who I end up becoming very close with and it helps me make hundreds of thousands of dollars. And is, uh, is he a Panamanian guy or is he a, Cal- a Calabrian in Panama? No, he is. Um, he's Lebanese. Yeah. But he's been in Panama forever as, as, as far as I know. They're very strong in Latin America. I don't know if you've noticed that. I have no idea. No, I have no idea. About really? That. Yeah. Lebanese are very good at money laundering. I'm going to say that right now. Uh, and I'm not just saying in Latin America, but uh, a lot of places that I went to in the world, Lebanese were there, bro. And they, and they were doing, you know, some serious stuff. So how I get into it, <clears throat> I go down there. The first thing I get is this deposit box. So there's a woman that uh, will, that runs a bank, mm-hmm. not runs it, but she's like, whatever, she's an assistant or manager or whatever. And she'll get me a de- deposit box. And the beauty of, of this thing is that I don't have to go in there with a passport. I don't have to go there in with anything else. I just have this box. And every once in a while, I put, you know, three grand in it, five grand in it, or I take out. And the crazier part of this story is... Um, hang on, hang on. So you're taking money from your contacts in Italy, flying it over to Panama and putting it in this box? Uh, sometimes, but more so, remember the guy that I had met from Panama. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay. So he, he, he got me some work in Panama as well. And it, and it ranged everything from helping people get through the, the Dorian gap. Yeah. Darien you know gap. That, or, sorry. Darien gap. Sorry. Um, I, I had a little couple things going on out there as well, but tell tell us about the money laundering. Whose yeah. cash are you putting in that safe deposit box? My own. Okay. My own cash. Gotcha. So this was like my safety net. Right. Yeah. Cause I didn't trust banks. You know, cause I literally had a friend that like gave me lists of client information for a bank. So I'm like, I, you know, like, never mind just the fact that my money's dirty and I don't want it being under scrutiny. Mm-hmm. At the same time, I don't trust banks to be capable right. of actually keeping my money safe. So tell us about Panamanian banks really quick though. Yeah. Are, are all the banks like that? Can you just walk in and get a safe deposit box without no. an ID or you got to fleece no, somebody? You got to pay somebody. It's tough. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Fr- from what I know. 
right? And I didn't get this by myself on my own. Okay. You know, I'm not going to act like I walked in there and right, did this right. myself. Somebody hooked it mm-hmm. up. And uh, like I said, I just used it as a box to put some savings in. I was in Panama a lot, a, 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 I'd say three, four times a year. And I would typically... Only one time in four years, I took money out, mm-hmm. right? It was one time one of my accounts got frozen um, and I had no money and I had to to get some money out of the safety deposit box. But other than that, every time I went to Panama, I was usually putting in five to eight grand. Gotcha. And that, that was usually cash, Yeah. right? So I had, you know, I have, I have a lot of contacts, obviously, in Winnipeg in Canada where I could take, you know, eight grand on the plane, bro. You yeah. know what I mean? 10, 10 grand's the right. limit. Right. So I would just go there and dump eight grand and right. you know, that's it. Move so that on. was your bank. You were, yeah. you would do your dirt around the world, whatever you were doing. And then you would come put the profits yeah. in your Panamanian bank. Great. But but that's just the savings. Yeah. So I had access to other accounts in two. I had one in Cardiff. I had one in Italy. I had one in Panama. And then I had another one in, in Canada. So I was going to say where it was, but I don't want to mm. snitch on myself here. And, and we were using a business in Canada right? We're, uh, washing a lot of money through there as well. That's, that's where I got uh, the majority of my money as well, uh, was from this company that we were embezzling, uh, quite a bit of money out of, I'd say, I can't say for the other groups that were involved, but I was getting around 200 grand from this place every year. I assume it was a cash business or no. Yeah, uh, it was, um, supplies, Interesting. Yeah. Like, uh, let's say like automotive supplies. So you had somebody on the inside that was stealing CFO. from the co- Okay. CFO. Wow. A CFO. Yeah. Okay. And your, your job was to then hide or wash the embezzled money. Yeah. Well, for me, I was introduced to this person to put the brakes on them and basically say like, we know what's going on with this place. We know that people are using it for this and that we know what the owners are involved with and, you know, extortion. And, uh, and we wanted our piece out of it. Right. Wow. So, so my piece ended up being a big piece and I bought that piece. That's an important thing to talk about. I actually paid for the information to get to the CFO. Right. So that's back in, uh, I'd say one, I want to say that's like 2018, 2019, where I get involved in that. So keep in mind, some of the rackets were really small. I'm talking about those USB sticks. Mm -hmm. That's only bringing me like what, 30 grand a year. Right. Right. Uh, but I had all this other stuff going on as well. I'd say I was probably running three or four different rackets a year. And that was where I went from making, you know, I told you that first year I, whatever, I made like 30 grand or whatever it was. And then I did 200 the next year. And then I did 400 the next year. And then I would say from 2018 or 19 up until 2022, which is last year when I walked away from everything. I was doing at least $400,000 a year. Wow. Just between all of your rackets. Yeah. So you're an international criminal. I was, yeah. Wow. So you're like an independent (laughs) guy. You're connected to organized crime, but you're essentially just a freelancer. The best place to be. Wow. Totally. Yeah. Because I had, man, I had backup. I had connects. I had whatever. I I, I was treated with a lot of respect. Mm -hmm. I had a nickname in Italy uh, with with, um, a Calabrian group, and and it was El El Lupo Solat. Solatario, which is like the lone wolf. Ah, uh, you know, I was going to guess Gordo. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's Spanish. Right? Come on. Yeah, no, my. Sh- um, and you're so you're stashing money in in uh, banks around the world, but mostly Panama cash. Yeah, for the savings that I don't touch. Yeah, was in Panama. You got to have that nest and egg. It wasn't a lot. Got to have that nest egg. Yeah, you got to have that you couple did. hundred thousand. We call it get out of town cash, right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah. that was my like. If sh- hits the fan in Canada, I take a flight to Panama. I go grab this money. I. Mm-hmm and disappear. Mm-hmm. Right. And I, I was never worried about that. Like, keep in mind, like I said, it was white collar crime. It was big. Tell was us about, tell scale. us about some of these other hustles. First of all, tell us about how you were helping smuggle migrants through the Darien gap. So one of the trips that I went on, we can't talk about all the countries that I went to. I, I did, I did 33 countries in, in six years, but, uh, in, in, I don't want to, I want to get this right. So 2020, 2019, I think I was in Ecuador. Right. And, uh, I fell in love with it, man. It was right in the heat of uh, COVID and, uh, nowhere else was open. Mm. So I was like, I'm going to Ecuador. I need to go back to Latin America. And this is the only country I can get into. I'm going, 
So I went there and nothing was really going on for me at that point. I had a lot of money put aside and stuff like that, but nothing was really going on. And uh, I ended up becoming friends with a lot of Venezuelans out there. Mm. Um, And these guys wanted to get into Panama. So I don't know if you know this, but Panama is a hub for a lot of different reasons. I'm aware. Yeah. Yeah. So drug hub, flight hub. You Money know, laundering hub. Yeah. And and even like legitimately, like, you know, the Latinos that want to move to other countries and make money, Panama's great. It's the US dollar, mm-hmm. you know? And, yep. and in, let's say they're making 200 back home a month. They can go to Panama, make 500, 600, 800, 1,000, which is like unheard of. How? So, how doing what? Legitimate jobs. Just, just labor. Oh yeah, just labor. Yeah, you can That's like right money. now, I know a girl from Honduras uh, that lives in Panama And she runs a call center for these uh, New Yorkers uh, that basically like left her the company to manage. And most of the, uh, most of the employees are making at least 750 USD a month, which is a lot of money. Yeah. For someone from Honduras. Yeah. That's a whole year. She's making even more, right? Cause she's supervising the thing. Yeah. So she's probably making like 1500 or something like that, which is a lot of money. So yeah, Panama is such a, you know, an important place. So anyways, I become friends with these Venezuelans and, and some Ecuadorians as well. Some, some, some people out there and, uh, and they begin to tell me like, you know, we want to get to Panama. You know what I mean? Like, so these are migrants. These are people that fled Venezuela. Yeah. They started telling me like, you know, do you know anyone like out in Panama? I was like, yeah, I've been going there the last couple of years. And, you know, I didn't, obviously I didn't talk about what I was doing, but one guy, my barber actually, uh, I got really close with him and I started telling him certain things and he wanted to get the f- out of Ecuador mm-hmm. and he had a lot of friends that were willing to pay and they were willing to pay good money and the cartel guys were taking less right because it's obviously the cartel moving them through the mm-hmm. Colombians um, but they you know I can't say for everybody but for like most of these guys they, they were paying around 1500 to 2 grand each person just, to, just to get to Panama yeah oh but like, if you really think about it, like for the, you know, it's a, it's, it's a dangerous route to take through, through the, how, how the gap do you in get, the military. uh, how do you get from what, what city in Ecuador were you in? When the- I was in Quito and then I spent some time like on the coast. Mm-hmm. I was in Guayaquil. So and- how do you get from Quito or Guayaquil to Panama? Uh, to be honest, bro, I don't know. I'm not going to lie. Hmm. Uh, I didn't walk the guys there. Right. You know what I mean? I just kind of found them the contacts, but you got to keep in mind, these guys walked from Venezuela to Ecuador. Walked. Oh, yeah. They all Across walked. a continent. Yeah. It's wild. Well, no, but no, you're, 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 if you think about it geographically, maybe you don't know this, bro. It's, they're right next to each other. Oh, okay. Yeah, I always at, assume at Colombia, they have to go through Colombia, but you're right. Southern yeah, Venezuela. Exactly. I mean, still, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's not a, a walk, walk down the street. <laughs> you know, you know, Venezuela, right? So it's like mm-hmm. a lot of people are desperate to get out of there, but, um, yeah, so fast forward. We'll fast forward through all this stuff. I'll talk about my time in Colombia. Sure. So, right? that, so that real was, quick though, you would connect them with, you know, cartel guys, cartel guys yeah. in Ecuador. Yeah, that would smuggle them through Colombia, no, probably guys in Panama. Yeah, that would come out to Ecuador. Oh wow. Yeah, and take them through, right? And you just got paid a percentage <clears throat> per person. Yeah, like not not to be honest, bro. I I, I actually just wanted to help these guys. Yeah, I didn't make any. Oh, okay. Bro. Gotcha. Maybe 500 bucks per guy. Yeah. But you know, 20 go through, you make a little bit of money, mm-hmm. but, um, yeah. Okay. So after this, um, I'm actually in Ecuador when I get introduced to Colombia for the first time. So 2020, the year, the end of 2020, I'm in Quito in Ecuador. And one of my buddies from back home, the Cuban guy, he hits me up. And he says, uh, you know, I'm going crazy here. Like, you know, the lockdown was so bad in Canada, especially in Winnipeg at one point. So he's like, I need to get the out of here, man. He's like, where are you? I'm like, I'm in Ecuador. He's like, do you want to go to Colombia? And I was like, you know what? I haven't been there. Like, why not? He's like one of our friends, this girl, uh, we'll we'll name her Kay. Um, She's she's a national, a Colombian national, but she lives in, in Winnipeg now. And she was going out there and... I was just going to go to Bogota, right? And she hits me up and she says, you should really check out Cartagena. Mm. She's like, I'm going to be in Cartagena. So I said, okay, well, you know what I'll do is when it be uh, right after New Year, so like January 1st, January 2nd, I fly to Bogota myself to check everything out and just check out the country and stuff. 
And then uh, shortly afterwards, I um, I went to Cartagena. I was there for about a day or two alone, and then my friends start coming in. Now, this is where my life changes. Keep in mind, it's still it's still the pandemic, so everything's closing around midnight. Mm. Everything's dead. We go out. We have a good time, whatever. We're walking out. You know, there's a guy outside. He says, hey, you want to come to an after party? Normally, I would say, F- that, you know. Uh, but my friends, they were so they were so drunk and they they were having a good time. So I said, you know, okay, let's go. So we, you know, they have their own taxis, right? Mm-hmm. Like the guys that work for them, mm-hmm. and uh, we go to this club, and it looks like nothing from outside, right? You mm-hmm. can't tell that anything is inside, and uh, you know, we get to what looks like a house door. We go inside. There's you know a, a madam, like an older woman, working, and then you know two cartelitos, right? Like two little two little guys. Sitting there and a group, I should say, a group of them. Uh, and they pat you down and you we walk through curtains that kind of look like the ones behind me and the ones behind you. And we go down this flight of stairs and, you know, we open it up and all of a sudden we're in this club. And, uh, you know, there's a stripper pole with a catwalk across the swimming pool. And you know what I mean? So I mean, I'm having deja vu. Right? So, yeah. Yeah, we probably yeah. went to the same place. So you're in a whorehouse. You're yeah. in a, and you're the first time you're in Colombia. you walk mm-hmm. into one of these places thinking it's going to be like a bar. And you're like, why is every woman in here? Not only the most beautiful girl I've ever seen, right? but basically <laughs> butt naked. Yeah. So, so we get in and keep in mind it's, it's 12. So there's no one there. We're the only group there. Right. It's early. It's early. So I said to the guy, I was like, you know, what's going on here, man? Like, there's no one here. He's like, bro, it's 12. Like we, we just opened. You know, I was like, oh, okay, that's how it works over here. You guys open when everything closes. Mm. Okay. And then he's like, but check this out. You know, he goes over, he hits like some alarm or some whatever, makes some noise. It sounds like some, some siren goes off and then the girls come out and, you know, I'm, I'm thinking like I'm drunk, but I'm just laughing. I'm like, oh my God, here we go. So what happens is, uh, we're all having a good time. We're popping bottles. We're spending a lot of money. We're making friends with everybody. And then. There's this one girl and she's just like a thought, you know what I mean? Like just she's hair down to her ankles and fake, fake ass, you know, just like beautiful. Mm -hmm. Not my type at all, but my buddy loves it. He loves that type. Right. But she got sent to me by, you know, whatever the manager, the owner or whatever, because it was obvious I was the one with the money. So she comes and she starts talking to me and I literally say at one point to my friend across from me, I'm like, bro, switch with me. Let me sit with her friend. Her friend, quiet, shy, nerdy, had glasses, like kind of almost looked like a librarian or something like that and just had no interest in what was going on, was not impressed with the bottles, was not impressed with the flex, was just, just didn't want to be there. And and I liked her. Sure. Now, yeah, I was like, this this one's more like me, to be honest, right? That that's what I, that's what I was I thinking. I can take at the time. her out of this place. <laughs> oh, <laughs> said that's what happened. So many young men in a Colombian whorehouse. Right? <laughs> Baby, I can't I can be the get, only one. I, I can get be. you out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So oh, it takes me back. Yeah, I get to know her. I and I and I one of the first things I said to her, and my Spanish was okay at the time, but it was like broken. So it's basically saying like, what are you doing in this place? You know, I understand there, there, there's a certain type of woman that comes into this place. Like you don't fit the bill, right. you know? She, and she said, you know, I'm from Venezuela. Mm-hmm. You know what it's like out there? She's like, I have two kids, right? I have a, a three-year-old daughter and a, I don't want to say, I want to say like 10-year-old daughter and minimum wage is like five bucks. You know what I mean? A month. Yeah. 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 So it's horrendous. She's like, she, she told me the whole story and basically she was groomed, right? She had a, a girl that moved from Venezuela down there mm-hmm. and, uh, and lied to her, you know, in the beginning, in the beginning, mm-hmm. she wasn't stupid or anything like that, but she said, I'm working at this club. It's full of tourists. Uh, you'll be serving, you know, whatever. Right. So by the time she gets to the club, bro, cause she goes the illegal route, right? Yeah. She goes on the little boat and through the jungle and whatever the else three spends days. all our money probably exactly to get there yeah exactly yeah. so we spend the next couple of days in Cartagena my group of friends and we would go back there I liked the girl mm-hmm. uh I was not on a love thing though mm-hmm. I just liked spending time with mm-hmm. her didn't want to f- her nothing like that just uh 
Just wanted to chill with her. So we go back a couple of nights and then I get an email saying that they're about to shut down all the flights between Latin America and Canada. So we got to get the f- out. Now I'm thinking to myself, the last night that I was there, so this is like three days after I met her, I told her, I'm like, uh, I'm going to get you out of here. You know, I said, I'm going to get, I don't give a f- what you do. You don't got to come with me. I'll, you know, I'll get you back to Venezuela. I'll put some money in your pocket. You know, like I'll give you 10, 15 grand. You can start your own f- business, whatever the f- it is. I just want to get you out of here. You're not happy here. You don't make any money for this place. I can tell just by looking at she you. She just didn't want to f- a lot of guys. Yeah. No, yeah, she if didn't. You don't, f- you don't she make any like, money. And I end up talking to one of the bosses, right? Like the guy that runs the place when I asked for permission, mm. uh, whether, cause you know how it is. Some of them are on contract. They can't just leave, but I did ask permission from the guy and, uh, you know, it was a, car- it was a cartel owned place. Most of those places are, especially on the coast, big tourist money out yeah. there and stuff. Yeah. Right. So I, I, you know, I asked him, I'm like, you know, is it okay if she leaves with me? You know? And, you know, we talked for about 10, 15 minutes and eventually at the end he said, I don't see any problem with it. It's like, you're absolutely right. She doesn't belong here. Get her out of here. Mm. Whatever. So I head back to Canada. Uh, and at this point, feelings have, have grown. You're you know? flying with her back to Canada. No, I can't, bro. She's uh, Venezuelan, Of course right? not, right? Yeah, the visa. So you just got out of there, gave her a bunch of money. In that time, I sent her to Bogota. Like I said, I made a couple of friends that worked inside one of the hotels there. So they kind of watched over her and made sure that, you know, someone didn't jump on her because... You know, I didn't know the way things worked out there. I left immediately. I bought a ring. So I was gonna, I was not planning to propose to her right away, but I fell in love with her. How long after you flew back to Canada, did you return Two to weeks. Columbia? The okay, that's it. The minute they let okay. me out that hotel, I f- left. Gotcha. I think I spent one or two days visiting my friends. Cause I'm like, yo guys, I met this woman. Like I'm, I'm going to Columbia, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And you, you can imagine what they thought. Like you're f- nuts, man. You met someone that worked in a place like mm-hmm. this and. You know, I get it. I get it. I would never think that something like that could happen. And I would probably make fun of somebody that did the same right. thing that I did. I get out there. Um, two weeks later, like I said, I got a different room. I went, I showered. And then this was the most important moment for me, bro. It was when I knocked on her door uh, for her room. And that was going to tell me right there, is this real? Mm. Or is this just a f- game? Right. And she opened and she just started bawling and she jumped on me and hugged me and just kept saying, you know, te extraño, like I miss mm-hmm. you. And I proposed to her that night on the balcony, in a hotel in Zona T in Bogota. And then that started a whole nother chapter for me. Wow. And you're married to this day? Legally. Yeah. Wow. But I left her last year. Uh, I left everything, uh, including, you know, the, the cr- criminal life and everything else last uh, a year ago today. Like I was mentioning to you earlier a year ago today, I left Columbia. I left my marriage. I left the, you know, the criminal life left money behind lost. Uh, we'll, we'll probably have to talk this a little bit more in depth, but that same day or the same week I lost a quarter million dollars, which was all my money at the time. Okay. So yeah, we got to know about this. What, what was happening after you proposed to her? She said, yes, Bring us until, yeah, you left Columbia. What were you doing? I'm going to try and give the shortest version of this because it's so much. Mm-hmm. Like we were only together about two years, but like, holy, shit, we went through a lot, right? Yeah. Um, we bounced country to country. I ended up uh, reconnecting with my brother in Mexico after five years, six years wow. not seeing him. Brought her out there. Uh-huh. Met his wife. He had a baby with her. Great time. Probably one of the best moments of my life. Uh, going back to Mexico, seeing my brother, having a wife with me and just like this whole family thing. It was, it was beautiful. Craved it my whole life. We, we got married in the Bahamas, I want to say uh, four months later after we met. And then throughout this time, though, I'm trying to find somewhere for us to live because we're, we're basically living in Colombia and visiting other countries. Mm. Right. But we can't do this forever. You know, she could. She could go through the refugee status or whatever, or protected status. But it's going to be harder for me, especially because I'm a criminal. I don't want to be under the microscope. I don't want them looking at everything that, you know. What are so, you doing? What kind of crime are you running? At that time? Yes. I'm still, I'm still doing, uh, I'm still money laundering. Yeah. So I Who, still. Whose money are you laundering? Is it are you, uh, from all over the world? <laughs> Uh, typically it was from Canada, bro. right? So, so I'm same, doing it three, four times a year, right? Same hustle, same yep. embezzlement hustle. Got yep. it. 
Uh, so yeah, that was that the, that was the majority, bro. Right. That was the huge chunk, the lion's share. Right. Like I said, it's like two hundred, sometimes more a year, and that's how I got up to four hundred. Right. Right. If I'm still doing the thing in England once or twice a year, and I'm mm-hmm. making thirty to fifty k or whatever, and then I'm doing two hundred, two hundred fifty through here. Yeah. And then, you know what I mean? And then that adds up, and that's a huge amount of money in Colombia. Oh, you're rich. Forget about it, bro. Yeah, yeah. And where we ended up settling on, so I'm going to get to this, but we we end up settling on Paraguay. Mm. So I'm looking for places to move that are quick, uh, are not going to put me under a microscope, are sympathetic to the Venezuelans, because you, you got to use what you have, you know, and they really were. So for anyone that doesn't know this about um, uh, Paraguay, you can get your permanent residency usually within 70 days. It's good for 10 years. Oh, wow. There's no taxes on foreign income. And it gives you access to Argentina, Brazil, and Uruguay. Yeah. Same rights. Wow. So if you want to go to school, if you want to start a business, buy real estate, yeah. you can do it in all those places. So I'm like, this is ideal. Yeah. And it, was, it, was, it wasn't very, uh, wasn't very expensive at that time either. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. It was like for the whole package, mm-hmm. like paying the corruption's big there. Right? Yeah, so totally. You, gotta, you can you see why. Lawyers. Yeah. I fell in love with it right away. Like we're here. We found the country. We found where we're going to live. We can stop bouncing between countries. I can walk away from the because I wanted to walk away, bro. Mm. She had kids, you know, and the kids were going to come with us. Where are they living at the time? They were in Venezuela. Okay. Yeah. They were with her sister uh, in their family house. And then throughout the next year, some stuff happens. We get in some fights over really stupid shit. Is your money stashed in the same box yep. to where you originally got it? Yeah, for about four years. How much money you got in there at this point? At that your point, your nest egg. Sh- it wasn't. A, it wasn't a lot. Mm. Well, I'm not gonna lie to you. It was like at that point, it was probably like 70k. 70, what did you want to do? With getting out of the life, you know? Like uh, I had plans. So I had plans in Paraguay. Um, but I just want to like, before we get to that, I got, I got, I got to tell you how this whole story ends. Okay. Cause I was forced to walk away, even though I was on my way out, mm-hmm. it happened at a time that I didn't expect it to. So whatever we get in these fights, then I, I go nomad. I start going, uh, I want to say early 2022 in the span of a month and a half, I was on four different continents. I was, I don't know, in 10, 15 different countries. And I was just spending like crazy. And I was broken up with my wife at the time. Like I wasn't with her and I was bringing friends out everywhere. And I was, I was walking away from a lot of stuff. I was, it was a bad place for me. And you weren't making any money. You weren't hustling at all. I still had the, the embezzlement thing going, which was the, again, the lion's share. It's like money coming in. So how does that work real quick? So you, you're embezzling out of a company in Canada. Do you have to give a percentage to your contacts up there? No, because I bought it. Right. So one thing that I mentioned earlier on was like- So uh, you're just stealing money you're, and then hiding it. You're not really, this is not classic money laundering where you're taking it from one source mm-hmm. and disguising it. You're just jacking money and hiding it. Well, no, we you're did not do trying that to, as well. So well, explain for my that. own, for my own, for yeah. my, my, my share of the money. No, it was just, uh, we. it was moved through several different accounts in mm-hmm. Canada. And then a lot of it would come out uh, in cash for me. Right. Right. And then we, we had other ways of doing stuff too. Like I don't, I don't bring it up because we didn't do it very often, mm. but like, you know, diamonds, right? Gold. Really? What do yeah. we, how so? Uh, what about well, them? Man, like you can, there's a lot, you can get away with going through an airport, bro. We're only wearing a Rolex watch that's worth 30, 40 grand. You know what I mean? Right. Like stuff oh, like that. So you're taking stolen goods through or uh, no, some of them would be legitimate, like with sales like, and everything like that. Like a lot of the, a lot of it was washing money through, through that kind of stuff too. So goods, how, how goods. Are, so how are you, but explain that this is, this is what we have you here for. Yeah. How, how does that work? Okay. So I, I pay a guy, uh, to go and buy whatever a Rolex watch, a nice presidential or whatever, 30, mm-hmm. 30 grand, 25 grand watch. I pay him a little bit extra. Yeah. He goes and does the sale through a legitimate account, yeah. right? His own account or a business account right. or whatever. I give him a little extra piece right. for it, but you know, he signs it over to me and then it's, it's all legitimate. You just at washed that point, it. Right. Yep. Yeah. Or I, or I went at gambling yeah. or whatever the f*** else. Right. And then I take it over there and I f- sell it. Mm-hmm. Like I would do little, but I didn't do that very often, right. but it did happen a few mm-hmm. times. Right. Mm-hmm. And same with, uh, um, I didn't personally do it, but I had some friends that were doing it with gold. Right. Like they buy those little, uh, 
the little bars of gold. Yeah. And they'd, they'd stack up a bunch of them and some of them would buy them from uh, uh, Dubai, right? They can't bring them down to Winnipeg, sell them for an extra cost. And then some of the other guys were oh, taking see. that gold, bringing it to Panama or wherever else and selling it off there. Right. Interesting. So if you're in Winnipeg, let's say you buy legally purchased gold bricks from a guy in Dubai. Yep. And now and then you could sell that off in Panama and declare it as legal. Or you can just have it sitting in gold, whatever exactly. you want. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. The biggest thing that I noticed, again, this was a lot with other people because I, I didn't have to do it as much mm -hmm. because I had a lot of my money was coming from a legitimate company, right? Right. Like it was just, I we were embezzling it. It was illegal. So you were it, in on it with the CFO. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, so, and you CFO were lean, was in, in my hands and you were leaning on him yeah. through threat of violence or uh, no more, more extortion in the beginning, blackmail, blackmail, because this person was very shady. Wasn't, it wasn't a, you know, it wasn't somebody to feel sorry for. I'll so did you threaten that. them to like go public with some dirt that you had on them? Uh, no, that happened at the end. That's okay. when everything ended for me. Okay. So remember we had plans to move to Paraguay. Yeah. So, uh, November, of, uh, I, let's say late October of last year, 2022, I'm in Cucuta. Uh, we're at the Venezuelan border. She's waiting to get the last of the documents that we need, uh, for her kids. I believe it was a passport and a birth certificate for the other daughter and, and permission from the father so that she could leave the country for, to live somewhere else. So on that same trip, when I fly in from Winnipeg to Bogota, when I get to Bogota, I'm there for one or two nights airport by the hotel. I get a cryptic message from my fixer in Panama. And this is a guy that took care of things when I was not there for me. Right. Um, he was actually a taxi driver, uh, but he worked like hand in hand with the cartels. And he was just a, a straight up guy. Like this is the kind of guy you want to roll with you. Mm. I wish I had someone like him in Winnipeg because mm. I would have took over the city, mm. you know, not literally, but like, that's how you feel when you have someone that good next to you. Right. So he calls me and he basically says, you know, it's, you know, your money's. And I said, what do you mean? And he's like the, you know, the manager, the woman, she got arrested. I said, when did this happen? You know, it's like yesterday. I was like, what do you know? You know what I mean? Like, what What do you actually know? She got arrested. Uh, she had started doing some stupid shit. So it used to just be deposit boxes. You pay her a little bit, you know, per transaction. So if I want to put five grand in, yeah. I pay her like 250, you know, uh, 250 American. Yeah. And she had a nephew that worked at the hotel I stayed at. So I didn't even have to do shit. Mm -hmm. I would let them know a couple of days in advance, right? I would uh, get the nephew to come up, bring me room service. Mm. I'd either take money from him or give money to him, whatever I had prearranged uh, over those days. Right. And then he goes and sees his tia uh, the same night. And, and, and then she it puts up. it in the bank. Yeah. Oh, so you didn't even have to go to the bank anymore. It's perfect. Gotcha. Man. That's why it was such a good system. But what she started doing, so she was making a lot of money because I was mm. not the only guy. Bro. Of course not. Right. Yeah. And there was probably people putting way more than me. Mm -hmm. Right. A lot mm -hmm. of Colombians out there and right. stuff. So God only knows. But where she up was, and this is, I found this out later on, was she started taking fake IDs and setting up actual accounts for some of these guys, which is not how she started. The way she started was it's lock and key. Yeah, just cash, just a yeah. box. That's it. Right. And now you're actually using fake passports that, like, this picture doesn't even match the mm. fucking guy that's in front of you. Right. You start doing shit like and that. Those Unbeknownst get, to us. Right. And right? those get registered in the Panamanian. Yeah, you in know, the global bank right, and all that stuff. Right. right? So right. she fed up. And uh, yeah, they, as far as I know, um, she snitched. Uh, not, not on anybody in particular, but she used the money that people were putting in the boxes to buy her way out. Right. Which, which makes perfect sense. You know what I mean? But unfortunately for me, I lost a hundred thousand dollars that day. So she had the feds or somebody come down, arrest her. Definitely. Whether it was in collusion with Interpol or something like that. Yeah. And she got arrested for money laundering. Exactly. Wow. And yeah. so she cleaned out your safe deposit box. Yeah. So, and I asked him, I'm like, what do you think, bro? Like, do you think this is like, is, is it what it looks like? And he's like, he said exactly what I'm saying to you right now. He's like, if she was smart, she pointed to every single deposit box and bought her way out of that. Mm -hmm. He said that it's likely that either corrupt cops, 
the Panamanian government, or um, I don't know. He gave me another one. It was some kind of board that oversees like money laundering and uh -huh. stuff like that out there. He said that, uh, you know, it's, it's likely that, you know, one of those people have your money. So that's it. And it was crazy because for four years, man, nothing ever happened. Yeah. But unbeknownst to us, for almost a year, she was doing this with uh, fake passports and fake uh, residency cards and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Yeah. So she f***ed up the whole thing for everybody. So I don't know what happened to her, to be honest. I wouldn't be surprised if somebody got to her because uh, I didn't give a f I wasn't going to do anything crazy over a hundred grand. But like I said, God knows how much she was dealing with. So you are now broke? Almost. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I'm sitting in Cucuta. Uh, I, or sorry, I was in Bogota when I got that information. Oh. And it's I'm like, yeah, I'm like, this is my savings. Remember, I'm on my way out. I'm going to meet my wife, wait for a couple of days, go to Paraguay, apply for residency, walk away, have a hundred grand here. I have another 150 coming in over through the embezzlement, right? Mm -hmm. And then I have the potential through this company, something that I was working on for almost a year, where if this went through, it was a huge transaction and it was for supplies. And, but it was, it was basically like a, like a fake sale. Right. Right. But the money that was coming in was going to be in the millions and I could have named my price on it. Right. So I had a number in mind and it was between 300 and $500,000. So when I lost the hundredth grand, I was pissed. I was cheesed, but I was like, okay, I still have 150 K coming in. And I have this potential, even if I have bare minimum 150 K that's enough for us. Yeah. That's enough for, enough for us in Paraguay. I can go buy a condo. I can go buy a car. I can put 50 grand in the savings, make sure the kids have a little bit of money for school and whatever else. And I also had some business ideas that I wanted to do while I was out there. What were we going to do? Were you going to go straight? Straight. hundred percent okay. straight. Huh. So uh, I was going to do a, a call center, English speaking call center yeah. out there. Big money in that. Totally. And I had, uh, I had contacts in Panama that had, uh, connections with AT&T and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I could have got something going to the point where like, just to give you a breakdown of the money, this is good for legitimate money. You're paying about 450 USD per, per employee, but AT&T is paying you 750 to 800 per, and you got 40 employees working for you. And that's, and oh, that's a month. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we're talking about tens. Wow. Tens of thousands. So I'm, I'm good with that. And like my startup for that, what I, like what I was looking into, like, you know, just Dell desktops yeah. and, uh, you know, a little, uh, a little real estate space, like, uh, maybe for 40 computers or mm -hmm. whatever it was, it was going to run me maybe, I don't know, 50, 60 grand. So wow. small investment for that what is a good back. business. That's yeah. really interesting. Yeah. So you're and just it, contracted it, through AT&T or contractor. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. So that was one of them. I also wanted to, I'm, I'm big into hookah lounges, bro. So I had this American guy that moved to Paraguay. I was going to buy a hookah lounge off of him for like 40, 50 K. He, he didn't want it anymore. Mm -hmm. It was in that park that I told you about with all the food trucks. Yeah. Very busy place on the weekend, made a lot of money. Uh, he was bringing in between eight and 11 grand just off that place after everything. And he didn't even know how to run it. So if I, if I buy that place for 50 grand and I can turn it into 20 grand a month, I'm making my money back in two and a half, three months. Right. Wow. So yeah, everything was set up. Everything was sweet. And then, uh, like I said, I was, I was not panicking. I was pissed because I was like, you know, I lost a hundred grand in a day. I've never lost money in seven years that I was doing this, bro. All, all the, the, the scams or anything like that. I never lost money. Right. Uh, my own, you know what I mean? If, if a project failed or whatever, like whatever, how no. many, how many projects, as you say, are scams, Total, do you think you ran in seven years? Uh, probably like five or six. It wasn't like 20 or 30 or anything like no, that. No, but how many transactions? Like how many actual times? How many times did you hit a lick? Hundreds? Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Like if you look at, I, you know, I keep trying to, uh, as I was writing the book, I had to actually start thinking about what did I make here? Yeah. Like how much money did I actually do mm -hmm. in the book? I say between 2016 and 2022, I did two and a half million dollars, but I, I, I think I'm, I'm probably close to three and a half or four. Wow. Yeah. When I did the two and a half, there was some other stuff. Like I wasn't thinking about the money that I made, um, in London 
which was, you know, 30 to 50 a year for multiple years and a couple of other things that I was doing. So I, I think it's closer to three, three fifty. What was the money I, in London? Uh, that was the selling of the, the, the USB, yeah. like the banking information. Wow. That still boggles my mind. Yeah. It's so, you know what, uh, when I was trying to make a decision, whether I was going to stay away from the life or not, I was like, if I stay in this, I'm doing that full time. Cause like those guys, I knew guys that would sit in Dubai and make like a million dollars a month off that. Just, just buying cards and then selling them. banking information. Yeah. And then, and then selling them to the, the pros selling yeah. them to the Albanians or the Nigerians. Yeah. And you wow. know, all those guys, they know how to work with Bitcoin and everything. Like yeah, that too. of so, course. So easy to move money around. In Dude, that. the level of sophistication <laughs> in the, in the criminal world, especially in Europe is oh. like, dude, they're not exaggerating in the movies. I mean, it's, it's wild. So those guys, those guys can take those bank lists and they have credit card printing machines. And so they're able to just make credit cards with mm -hmm. those numbers and then just run them up till they expire. Exactly. And like, and what do you think they do? Do you think they just go buy a bunch of goods? You know? Oh no, they sent they Yeah. Yeah. Like, like if, if the you limit is 10 grand, you just go into Gucci and just buy, buy up until till it maxes out and then go sell that Gucci. Yeah. So I'll, like I'll tell you one specific scenario. Okay. And this is happening today. All right. Uh, this is a friend of mine that I just saw recently. Uh, he told me about this. So what he does with the cards is he's been buying in bulk furniture appliances uh, on like tens of thousands, you know, like twenty, thirty thousand dollar orders. Right. And what he does is he gets someone you know, let's say you want this uh, sofa and you want this fridge and whatever else. And it's the equal, it equals 30 grand or 20 mm -hmm. grand or whatever the, the whole deal. This guy will charge you like seven or eight, Yeah, but it's all profit for him. Yeah, of course. Of course. Right? He's buying it. So yeah, he's, Somebody he's, he's made out like that. And he has a, uh, he has a big plan to do something with that in the future. And I think it's genius. He kind of, you know, he asked me, you know, if, if I wanted to, you know, get into it, but I, I decided when I decided to walk away. Yeah. Right. So I just want to finish with that story too. Of course. With, uh, yeah. I don't all wrap up. Man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll get to the end here. Cause this is basically when the book begins. Right. Right. Um, so yeah, I find out my money's gone. I fly to Cucuta. Uh, and then for a couple of weeks I had deposits, legitimate deposits mm -hmm. coming through my, um, Canadian bank account. Mm -hmm. Right. And it wasn't very much, but it was like, you know, five grand, six grand, whatever. And this is coming from the legitimate, uh, sorry, legitimate source. So, um, all of a sudden my money stops coming in like for two weeks while I'm sitting in Bogota and Cucuta, I have nothing that comes in and keep in mind, I just lost a hundred K. So I'm like, I've got maybe 20 grand, 25 grand to, to myself got like 10 grand in the bank and I had like 10 grand American, maybe three to four grand in uh, pesos, Colombian pesos. I was going to ask you, uh, what banks, when you're moving money all over the world, mm -hmm. what's the best, if you're, especially if you're trying to hide the money, what banks are best? Like the names? You want the names? Sure. Yeah. So the one that I, uh, the one that I know that was used a lot was Scotiabank. Scotiabank. From Canada. Which is a can Canadian bank. Yeah. And that, so, oh, why is that me. the best? Um, they just they're the most corrupt, the wow. which is crazy to say, but it's, it's the truth. Uh, I'll tell you something that interesting that I heard. I can't tell you that this is factual, but I heard it from someone that is involved in banks. They told me a couple of years ago, you know, global bank does this survey every year of how many uh, companies are like red flagged for money laundering and mm -hmm. stuff like that. And a couple of years ago when I was in what I was doing, Canada was number one. You guys were number two. So that shocked me. Wow. Because I couldn't believe that, uh, I, that, that existed because to be honest, like up until I had met these guys in Italy and stuff like that, I didn't know much about money laundering and it never seemed to be a big thing in Canada. Not, not around the, the social circles I was in. Right. Right. I'm sure they had guys that did things for them but it wasn't like this big thing. So this guy told me, he's like, you know, number one was Canada. Like U S was like almost half, half the amount of companies. So let's say a thousand companies were red flagged for being, you know, uh, suspicious of money laundering or whatever. Canada took the number one spot. 
And I was like, that's, that's insane to me. I thought of like 50 other countries before that, like Malta and like, yeah, you think Swiss bank places. accounts, yeah. you know, you associate all these shady places. I don't know how they get away with it over there, but anyways. So, so is that, does that just all come from corruption from people that work inside the banks? hundred percent. Is that how that's possible? Yeah. You got to keep in mind that corruption is available on every level, bro. Mm -hmm. So it's not just, you know, smug, ignorant bastards will tell you that it only exists in Latin America or Africa or Asia or mm -hmm. third world countries, but it's more prevalent in the, in, in, in first world countries. Mm -hmm. It just looks different. You know what I mean? It's well, got it's, a different face. A lot of times it's legitimate companies that don't want to pay taxes. Yep. So I assume maybe it, so does a Canadian company have somebody make profits, right? Capital gains, but they don't mm -hmm. want to pay that heavy Canadian tax. So they want to move it to offshore yep. to Panama or the Bahamas. Yep. And, and so, I knew a lot of guys that did that, not even illegitimate, right. no criminal intentions. Yeah. I want to save some money on taxes. Yeah. Right. Right. And so you have somebody inside at Scotia bank mm -hmm. and how does that work? How do they get your, how do they get your money from your bank account in Scotia bank to a bank in the Bahamas? It's already there. There's, there's a Scotia bank in Panama. There's a Scotia right. bank in, in, uh, wherever you are in Canada, right? So how do they transfer that? But, but, but how do they transfer it offshore? Is it a click of a button or do you have to have somebody on the other end in the receiving country to uh, some, also help sometimes you facilitate it's as it? Sometimes simple as it is, is it already being there? So for instance, like if you have a, if you have a Scotia bank account in from Winnipeg mm -hmm. and you go out to Panama yeah. and you go into a Scotia bank in Panama, yeah. You can go access money there. Right. You, your money from Winnipeg. Yeah. You can get a safety deposit box. You can apply for loans. But can't well, they depending. find that though? Doesn't that seems like the authorities that's easy to trace? Yeah. But a lot of the guys that did that, what I'm talking about, were doing it in a legitimate sense. Right. Like, like they, they wanted to do, uh, they just wanted to do business between Panama or save taxes or whatever else. But it's not illegal to, um, to like, Let's say, for instance, a Canadian guy goes to Panama, mm -hmm. registers a business, starts his PR process, right. and just moves money into that bank account and and starts. That there's nothing illegal about but doing that. But he makes that, the right? money in Canada. Yeah, there's not. Yeah. Uh, hmm. Interesting. Yeah. No, I think that is illegal. Okay. You you have to pay tax in the country that you make the money. Yep. Now, yeah, if yeah. you were gonna, you're right. Like Google, for instance, is notorious. Like they're uh, in Ireland, mm -hmm. they have big offices there now because you're, they have low tax over there. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's, there's many, many ways to, to get around it or like walk the line, yeah, yeah. I think. But yeah, that definitely makes That's a good sense. Way of putting it, walking the line. That definitely yeah. makes sense uh, to have a bank that's already operating in the country where you want to move the money. That's mm. the easiest. Yeah. Um, wow. That is fascinating. Yeah. There's this whole criminal, this whole shady world of money that's instant mm -hmm. that moves around the world and it makes the world go around. Yeah. And mo mo the ordinary citizen has no idea it's going on. Well, and I'm seeing a lot of it coming from, like I said, like white collar stuff now. So it used, it's been around forever because of drugs, right? Yeah. And we can go back to, you ever see Banksters, the documentary Banksters? No. Okay, you should check it out. Okay. So they talk about HBSC and how it started oh, and right. the opium trade back in the day and all this crazy stuff. It was basically a bank that was created for, you know, drug dealers, right. traffickers, right. right? So, but what I'm seeing now from my own personal experience, remember, remember, I was not at the, I was not at the point of sale on a, every one of these things, right? I had a little involvement in everything, but I was not the guy that was like inside the bank, like doing these things, right? Mm -hmm. I was usually the guy that connected somebody mm -hmm. to move something over or whatever. And I got paid my percentage for yeah, it. Yeah, you were just and taking I, a fee, middle yeah, manning. Exactly. Yeah. And and honestly, it was the safest place to be, to right. be honest. Okay, so okay. How, how does it all conclude? How does it all crash and burn? <laughs> okay, yeah, that's that's basically what happened. So um, Bogota, I get the call. I'm out in Cucuta. My money's not coming in. Uh, everything kind of just stops. I lose a bunch. And then all of a sudden my flow, like the money that I had coming in, both legitimate and illegitimate were just, everything just halted all of a sudden. And I, got, I became extremely paranoid. I became, I thought uh, people in my inner circle did something. Mm. Like my shit was, was, was pretty airtight for, for a while. And uh, I thought the only way that this is happening is somebody that I'm close to is around right now, you know? Yeah. 
So I became very paranoid uh, to the point where I almost did something very brash and I, and I was going to have someone seen, you know mm. what I mean? Uh, Cause I was in Columbia at the time. I couldn't do anything. Somebody back in Would, Canada. So your crew was still based in Canada, your inner circle, the people that you trusted the most. It sounds yeah, like. Yeah. But okay. a lot of these guys, I'll tell you the truth. I told you what my nickname was. I was the lone wolf. And it was because I didn't take a lot of these guys to do anything, bro. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? I had some people that I worked with, but my brothers, like my best friends, uh, the guys that were with me every day when I was in Winnipeg, I did not involve in anything. Right. You know, I didn't want that for them. Mm -hmm. And they ended up getting involved in some other stuff, which I didn't want them to get involved with. I really tried hard to like let everybody enjoy the fruits of my labor without taking the risk. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, everything's, you know, screwed up and you know, a beautiful thing happens at this point though, too. One day, a day before my birthday, I tell, you know, my wife basically what's happening. I say, listen, like, you know, I failed, you know, I don't think we're going to be able to do this. I don't think we can go to Paraguay. I don't think that, you know, I'm going to be able to give you the life that I offered you and, and you know, all this. Like, you know, I, I can understand if you want to go back to Venezuela or to Ecuador where she has some family and, and, you know, just end things, you know what I mean? Cause like, I, I have nothing to provide you anymore mm -hmm. and I'll never forget. Like I said, it was a beautiful moment because it was the first time in two years where all my insecurities and all my whatever just disappeared. And she looked at me and she said, like, are you crazy? Like after everything that we've been through the last two years, do you not see I'm not with you for the money? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't give a what you have. If we have to go to Paraguay and I have to work three jobs while you sit at home, like, I don't care. Like we're in this together. And again, it was a, it was, it was a, a reassuring moment. It was beautiful to have in such a, in such a terrible moment, but, um, it was short lived. Um, I, once I realized that everything was that I lost everything and I'm down to like 15, 20 grand, I, I realized that the right thing for me to do is to go back to Canada and, and, you know, be with my friends and just kind of figure out what's going on and send, send her back home to her family with whatever, whatever I have left. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Cause like, I know like money's going to come later on. Right. But right now, if we go to Paraguay with this money, after I do the application process, the residency, all that, shit, I'm done. I'm I, I'll burn through the money in three mm -hmm. months. And then what, you know, if we can't work, if we don't get the residency right away, we're screwed. Mm -hmm. So you know, I, I approached it like that. I said, listen, like, you know, I think that you should go back to Venezuela. I'm going to send you home with like, you know, five, 10 K and I'll, I'll take five or 10 for me. I'll go back to Canada. I'll get something sorted out and we'll revisit this, you know, down the road. And she took it the wrong way. She thought I didn't want to be with her cause she had kids. And I was like, man, I've been with you for two years. I married you after just after where I met you and you know, all this stuff. Like, how could you think that I care about that? You told me the first night that you had kids. I didn't care, but she took it that way. And I believe she genuinely did. She thought like, uh, I wasn't interested in her anymore. It's like, no, that's not at all. I feel like I failed you. What I promised you originally, I can't give it to you anymore. So I'd rather you go home, be with your family, be safe, be around people, you know, in a country that, you know, have some money for yourself and we'll revisit this thing. We got in a huge fight. We ended up, um, ending things for good. Um, <clears throat> I went to Bogota for a couple of weeks, just kind of laid low, just kind of thought about everything and stuff like that. And then I went to Vancouver, uh, before I went to, I was actually going to stay in Vancouver for a couple of months. Um, one of the companies that I was talking about, uh, that we were, you know, moving money from mm -hmm. embezzling and stuff was, was in BC. And I had some money trapped in one of, you know, in one of the businesses and it was quite a bit. You know what I mean? It was like six figures, like a hundred grand or something like that. So I went to try to get that money and I was so desperate at the time though. And when you're emotional mm -hmm. and you're desperate, you make stupid decisions. You know, the first time in my life that I really made a stupid decision, I sent somebody over, you know, we'll, we'll call him a biker, uh, t to visit this person mm -hmm. and basically say, you know, not, not in a physical violent way, but basically say you owe someone money, pay them their money, you know? And then a couple of days later, I get uh, an email from one of like Canada's top lawyers and basically saying like, I know about everything that you've been doing. This person, this uh, CFO went and, and basically said everything, but I knew what it was. I knew what it was. The CFO is at the fault. They're f like, if this person, this person was scared of what was going to happen. So went and lawyered up and mm -hmm. said, Hey, 
you know, what can I do here? Mm. But it wasn't, I knew what it was from the beginning. It wasn't going to, they weren't going to come after me for a case or anything like that. Cause that person is the most guilty and, and the first person going down. You know what I mean? Like the people that uh, profited off of corruption, obviously they're criminals and they're going to have consequences to it. But the person that made it available to them, you know what I mean? That stole mm -hmm. from the company. Sure. The one that had, you know, typed up the orders and, and passed mm -hmm. everything through their they're the most guilty. So did the company <coughs> find out? Did they do like an audit and say, where's all this money going? No. Um, that's what I believed Probably. happened at first. Right. But uh, I also throughout the years, <clears throat> excuse me. I also believe that the owners were in on it. I think that, uh, yeah, I heard that like uh, there was, there were two brothers. I heard that one was like a degenerate gambler, cokehead loser. You know what I mean? And that's why they, they, you know, they put the brakes on him. Cause uh, he, he had debts, right? I believe, I don't know for sure, but what it sounds like is the embezzlement started happening when this guy started owing gangsters a lot of money and they said, okay, we're going to use your company. Mm -hmm. We're going to, whether it's through um, goods and purchases right. or actually just milking it out for a paycheck, right? Like myself, uh, to give you a real idea of how it came to me, I had a, an account set up that was a payable account. And it was an insurance company. It was fake. It was my account. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But I had it constantly coming in. Where do you have that account registered? That Canada. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. And it was a legitimate account. Yeah. Like in, in the eyes of the law at mm -hmm. that time, mm -hmm. it was, you know, it looked legitimate. So, so I make this final stupid error, you know, I send someone over a day or two later, I get this email and it lets me know I got to stop it. It's, it's going to be talked about in the book. Uh, I told you, I released the book on October 1st, 500 copies only to my city and some friends. The book comes out January 1st, but um, the, the copy that everyone's read right now, there's going to be like two or three bonus chapters. And one of the things I say in it is like, sometimes we actually have that choice in life, like that one choice that changes everything. And I believe that if I pursued this route with this money, that I had tied up in this company, um, I would have got it. First of all, I would have got the money. I don't have any doubt of that if I pushed, but I, I know for sure I would have went to jail as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I use that as a, as a, as a motivation and inspiration for myself because a year ago to the day, almost I lost everything. I lost my empire. I was making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. I had a wife. I was moving to a South American country. I was about to set up legitimate businesses. I was walking away from the life. I was good. I had money saved, whatever. It was all, you know, peachy. And then, you know, this happens and I, I go to being broke and I have, you know, I can make this choice. I can go and put the brakes on this person and rough them up or have someone rough them up and get that money. I decide not to, right? And this year, what I've gone through this year, I think I heard you talk about it on an episode. I can't remember what which one it was, but it's a come down. Mm -hmm. um, you go from making hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. I was visiting 10, 15 countries. I was living good, yeah, bro. It's exciting. And then I'm um, just, I worked a job this year, bro. Yeah. For the first time in my Ooh. life. Uh, not my life, sorry. Nine, uh, 10 years. Yeah, it hurts. So I'm making like, you know, I was... Okay. It was, it was good. I was in a club and I was only working part-time and I was bringing like three, four K uh, a month. Not bad, you know, for the hours that I was right, putting in, right. but three or four K bro. Yeah. I used to make that every two or three days, bro. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it was such a come down, but luckily, you know, I always had in my mind to write a book. I thought I had an interesting story. A lot of stuff I haven't been able to talk about today, um, is in that book. January, uh, sorry, June of this year, I actually sat down. I wrote it in about a couple of months. I dropped it in October. Um, I, two weeks ago, I was in, uh, uh, New York, had it posted on times square, the worldwide announcement nice. for January 1st. And then now I'm here sitting with you, bro. So where can I, I get I, the book? Uh, so you can contact me through my Instagram, right? Uh, the real Germano Tomasetti at the real Germano Tomasetti. Um, that's the best way for now. I'm going to be, uh, starting my own podcast in January. And it's going to be a lot like uh, a lot like what you do, bringing true crime guys mm -hmm. in, but not just um, stuff like that. Like I, we're, I'm going to be talking to like Ukrainian ref refugees yeah, and cool. Syrians that came in, like just interesting people. Totally. And and it's starting with my city. All the guests are going to start with uh, with within my city. So uh, 
just to say quickly to wrap this up, I only have 150 copies left. So oh, between yeah, now and January 1st, um, go get those people. Yeah. 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 Hit me up if you want to see the book. And if not, wait till January 1st. It'll be a uh, audio book available, ebook, Amazon, Etsy, all right. those platforms. All of that. Yeah. Germano. Uh, very, very nice to meet you. Loved hearing your story. Thank you. Bro. Uh, it was very romantic. It reminded me of the old, the old times. You I, know? I thought, I thought just going country to country. Yeah, no, it definitely, uh, uh, I'm glad it's over with, but yeah, yeah it was fun while it lasted. It was a good time. Thanks my man. Thank you.